Coffee Monday is more than a podcast. It's a movement to reshape the way we approach Mondays and the week ahead. It's about embracing the reality that work doesn't have to dominate our lives. It's about finding that sweet spot where passion, purpose, and a cup of motivation connect. Filmed and recorded in California's Central Valley, join me, your host, Ray Pardini Matson, as I invite thriving professionals to share their stories of how they're crafting a life that's both vibrant and balanced. Two time Major League All Star CJ Wilson isn't just a star athlete, he's a family man with a beautiful wife and four blessed children, and he's a car guy and a Bitcoiner and a podcaster, and a photographer. This car guy grew up actually racing on the dirt track, which is super cool, and now has his own suite of luxury car dealerships. With big plans ahead, I'm super stoked to welcome CJ to the show and look forward to sharing his story and the tremendous value he brings to the Central Valley. CJ Wilson here, so excited to have you. Thanks, Ray. I'm, I'm so excited. This is I, so fun. I'm very familiar in the podcast format, I so know. it's good. It's I good. know. You need to teach me something. I'm actually really excited. I was lipi- I was uh, looking through Instagram, you know, and like a clip of you pulled up interviewing somebody, and I was like, yo, Ray, what's up? <laughs> podcast homies, let's I go. I know. You inspired me. And I don't know about so, that. So you've had more than one, though. Throttle Dogs, I know for sure. Yeah, that's the car that. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had a, I had a Bitcoin podcast. Uh, for a while, and I've been a guest on a lot of podcasts over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done podcasts from uh, Carnivore Diet, like there's a podcast called The Meat Mafia, um, yeah. and uh, I've done baseball stuff and like all kinds of things. Car stuff, years. yeah, lots of car stuff. Um, yeah. But podcasting is a cool format because it's it's like a decentralized expression, and you can have a real interview mm-hmm. as a former interview subject with baseball. It was people would interview after a game and they're like so you gave up a home run you really suck tonight <laughs> you're like oh cool thanks and they're like what were you trying to do i was like throw a slider in the dirt and they're like but well, you threw it down the middle i'm like yep like, why <laughs> uh you know it slipped I'm, I'm sorry you know um and then you know it, those you have these soundbite interviews and mm-hmm. you don't ever really get to know anybody unless mm-hmm. they're quippy and if they're quippy generally they're kind of a jerk so then yeah. you try to be quippy and then you come off as a jerk and you're like maybe i'm doing this all wrong <laughs> and then podcasting kind of like like the the big the big bang of podcasting a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and then i started listening to a lot of podcasts especially during covid i think that I was bet. when podcasting really took off mm-hmm. so what are some of your favorites that you listen to um, I listen to a lot of podcasts on science, actually, oh. uh, and on Bitcoin, uh, monetary policy sounds like super mm-hmm. amazing. I, I, I feel like investing podcasts are kind of interesting because you can learn stuff. There's people that are so yeah. specialized in different niches yeah. and you can get, it's like, this guy has been doing this for 10 years. Maybe he's got something there. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have some weird little hack like, oh, get a Montana LLC for your car or a South Dakota residency for tax purposes or something weird yeah. like that. And you're like, literally never considered that. So, mm-hmm. OK, just another thing. Um, but, yeah, I'm just interested in, you know, whatever, all the stuff out there. I feel like your brain is always going, never stops. You're always got something going on there. So you mentioned Bitcoin. You're very involved with the Bitcoin community. Tell me about that. Well, Okay, so I have to go way back, right? Yeah, like way, way go. back. Let's go. So how, how back? How I'll, I'll go. I'll try to do this in chronological order. So first of all, let me establish that the money is broken. Our dollar is a complete sham of a currency at this point, mm-hmm. and that started when they formed the Federal Reserve. Uh, there's a book about that called The Creature of Jekyll Island, and yeah. it explains how a couple really large banks got together to conspire to make the Federal Reserve. Um, this is a very scary topic when you delve into it. So I'm just mm-hmm. warning everybody if they want to think, if they want to take the, the blue pill and pretend everything's okay, like the matrix, <laughs> go back in. <laughs> things fine. Do not read this book. Yeah. Um, but if you've read mon- if you've studied the economy at all, or if you're an investor, it's good to understand where money comes from, what money is. Mm-hmm. And, um, in that regard, in 1971, when the uh, American dollar, U.S. dollar, came off the gold standard, Nixon depegged the. So you couldn't. You used to be able to just take dollars, mm-hmm. and you could go to a bank or you know a, a really go to a government institution and say, "I want my gold." Yeah. And if you had three hundred dollars, they'd give you three hundred dollars worth of spot value gold right there at mm-hmm. that point. Um, and then in 1971, they decided to you know, change that. And since then, there's been a massive increase in uh, monetary supply. 
and a massive increase in productivity, Mm -hmm. but not a massive increase in wages. It used to be back in the 60s that if you had any kind of regular job, you could afford a house and it would just be a smaller house or something like that if you had like a regular job, like you worked at a grocery store or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now you can't afford a house unless you have a really high paying job. And this is an example, but there's a website called WTF Happened in 1971 and it's amazing. So if anybody wants to like really get up to speed, that's Mm -hmm. it. So knowing all this stuff and getting involved in maybe like investing at a young age, uh, because my grandfather was a calculus professor. So he taught me how to day trade when I was 12. I feel like you're very math minded. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, math is very simple in this regard. This is why I see everything in math. Mm -hmm. Do I want this or this? That means this is worth more. This Mm -hmm. is one. This is zero. That's everything. Yeah. Everything I see in a binary sense that I want this outcome, not this outcome. I'm going to go that way. And if you keep going that way you start to see patterns in things and you start mm-hmm. to see that certain things have more value than other things. And it's like, you know, you have to make a choice. If you have $1 to spend, where are you going to spend it on? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So anyways, 2007, I'm actively investing. This is, so I've been investing for a long time. I'm in, in re- Bitcoin, real estate. I'm in real oh, estate okay. at this point. Just inv- okay. And I, I get really gun shy because, um, you know, I was like, I, it, I mean, if you've seen the big short, you'll understand this, but yeah. I had a condo in California. I had a condo in Dallas. I was living in Dallas in my condo. Mm-hmm. Um, I got offered a condo in Austin at the W Hotel. They were like doing this condo project or whatever. And I was like, oh, it's only 30 grand. I'll put a deposit on that. I'll probably be able to flip it by the time they do the second or third phase or something like that if in I get in early. Yeah. And then I got, I was like, wait a second, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? This mm-hmm. is, I have no control over this. And then what, what happened was there was a, um, there was a situation where the, um, I found out that I, I was actually paying more in the early phase of the project than people were paying in the later phase. So mm-hmm. usually it's the opposite way around. If you right. get a, a new development, the people that are in first benefit from what's called the Cantillon effect, which mm-hmm. is they're closer to the, to the, they're in, they're trading on insider information basically. So, um, I pulled my deposit out and then I pulled all my money out of the stock market completely. And I was like, I don't like what's happening because I'd already been investing for a long time at that point. I was in the majors. I was making pretty decent money at that point. And, um, I was living in Texas and okay. So just to picture this, right. Mm -hmm. I'm in, I'm from Southern California. Yeah. Everybody love everybody. Right. That whole vibe. (laughs) Orange County surfer dude, like everything's cool. Yeah. And then I'm living in, in Texas and people are like, Oh man, we're going to have a Democrat in, pre- in the office and it's going to ruin everything. And I was like, well, what's going to happen? And they're like, oh man, everything's going to go to crap. And I was like, maybe these people are right. So I literally started buying these people. I mean, you know, like it, they weren't my people yet. I'd only been living there for right, a year and a half, but it right. was very influential. So yeah. I started buying uh, gold, silver, guns, uh, loose stones like diamonds and rubies and i was i was i was like okay in case the united states government collapses for some reason right i have a bag full of stuff i can leave and if i have to go to switzerland or aruba or whatever i can make it at that point i could fit my entire life in a bag i didn't have a lot of stuff i just you know i didn't have a lot of possessions i was 26 i didn't have i didn't have stuff i didn't have kids i didn't have anything anything like that i just had my future to worry about Mm-hmm. And, you know, on the baseball team, you have players from Japan, Venezuela, Dominican, you know, Mexico, like all Puerto Rico, all over the place, mm-hmm. uh, Alabama. Woo. Uh, so <laughs> it's like, OK, well, I could just get a passport. If I lived somewhere else, I could just fly in and play for the season and fly back home if, if I had to leave America because it just fell apart. Like the purge. You were thinking ahead. Yeah, I was really worried. Yeah. I was kind of a, you know, I'm like a doomsday prepper. Right. Are so. You? Yeah, well, in in this regard, financially, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, I can see that. So then I became like a hardcore gold bug and started researching all this stuff. Mm. The economy tanks, you know. This is when gold was like seven fifty, eight fifty an ounce. Gold now is like two thousand dollars an ounce, roughly. Mm. So um, I had piled all my money into like, portable money, and I was like, "Oh, I'm in Texas. I can have a gun and gold, and like I'm good to go." <laughs> like that was literally the mindset. It was that the simple. Basics. It was yeah. that simple. Um, and uh, yeah, so the world didn't totally collapse, but the economy did. Mm-hmm. The, Feder- the, the Federal Reserve lent uh, the government $880 billion and printed all this money. Mm-hmm. The housing uh, market completely tanked. In some places, never recovered. And I dodged that bullet because I was scared. Yeah. Good so for in you a way, like that, my though. fear opened me up to that. So then mm-hmm. a couple years later, I heard about Bitcoin 
And I was like, oh, pfft, like computer money for nerds. Like, and then it was like, then it was, there's this thing called the Silk Road where people are using Bitcoin to pay for illicit services. Hmm. Uh, yo, I want drugs delivered to my house. Like I'll pay you in Bitcoin or there's like weird stuff. Yeah. And I was like, oh, sketchy. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm like running a children's charity and stuff. I'm like, I can't get involved in like drug dealer money. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, so I didn't really get it until probably 2017, 2018. That's when I started really looking into it. And Bitcoin went from like $1,000 to $20,000. And I was like, this is accelerating too high. It's going to crash. This is a bubble, mm -hmm. you know, yada, yada. Because mm -hmm. I've been investing for a long time. And I was like, this is not a good pattern. Like things don't 20x like this that in this, this period of time. Yeah. yeah. And then it crashed down to like three, 4,000 or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Like, why didn't it go further? If it was a scam, if it was a Ponzi, like it would have collapsed. So then I read the Bitcoin white paper, mm -hmm. uh, which is like an eight page document that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote in, in on Halloween of 2008. And I was like, oh, my gosh, there's a limited supply. Oh, OK. Then I got it. Then I understood the whole thing. Everything mm -hmm. clicked into place at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and then I kind of was, you know, all in on Bitcoin. All in. Uh, to a degree. I mean, it's like, obviously, you have to look at all investments as a hedge. But it's a very simple question. Do you trust Janet Yellen with your entire life's work and your entire life savings? Fair. If the answer is no, then you should probably look into Bitcoin True. and other alternative assets. Mm -hmm. And that, So you've been it? involved in you know kind of educating yourself on bitcoin for a lot longer than i thought you mm -hmm. said probably what six years yeah yeah wow and has it been around for about that no bitcoin's been around since 2009 oh, okay so it's been around for like almost 15 years now yeah wow yeah so fast forward to today sure you've been asked to present on the topic mm -hmm. educate others on the topic go on podcasts about the topic right mm -hmm. all the things yeah i mean i actually had like a bitcoin podcast called the bitcoin bottom line yeah. where we discuss all these different things in the, t in the sense of like we're all, it's very early in Bitcoin still. There's mm -hmm. very few people that actually use it uh, relative to the world population. But, you, you know. Do you think that's, pause on that, yeah. sorry. Do you think that's because of lack of education? Yes. Because I sometimes feel that way. You've taught me a lot about it. Mm -hmm. I've done a little bit of my own research, but I still feel like I could definitely educate myself more about it. So if, you know, so yeah. maybe there's like an intimidation factor or, uh, just an approachability that isn't there for some people. Yeah, it, it takes someone that has the ability to slim down the technical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like farming or anything else, like until you really uh, see there's a tangible aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Because if you tell somebody that's a normal investor, oh, hey, if you buy this plot of land and you plant trees in seven years, you'll be able to start Truth. making money. Right. And people don't see the value in that, mm -hmm. right? Until they understand that, it's formulaic and that you can use that as a kind of more of a, a steady portfolio asset, you know, mm -hmm. and then you look at it that way. So with Bitcoin, I try to tell people to think from counting from the bottom up, not from the top down. So when people say, oh, one Bitcoin is X, Y, Z dollars, mm -hmm. that's kind of irrelevant. It's more like how many Satoshis do you have? Now, a Satoshi is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin, like mm -hmm. a penny, mm -hmm. except it's 100 millionth. So if wow. you have 100 million Satoshis, you have one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But if Bitcoin goes up in value, like it has been over the last 15 years, and it keeps kind of marching, it's going to be volatile as people discover what it is. Right. Um, but if the total Satoshi count is 2.1 quadrillion, the total value of every asset on the planet today mm -hmm. and all the money ever created, all the real estate, all the Rolexes and Porsches and diamonds and stocks and art and everything mm -hmm. is like $600 trillion. So right. 2.1 quadrillion is like three and a half times 600 trillion. So theoretically mm -hmm. you could get to the point if there was ever anywhere near cent or sorry, sat like one sat and $1 parity, mm -hmm. then that means that a Bitcoin would be worth a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. or more. And so that's, wow. that's, or, or anywhere near that, mm -hmm. you know, and if mm -hmm. so, then if you have 10,000 sats in the future, you know, you could have more, more value than you mm -hmm. have now. So the idea mm -hmm. is wherever you buy the, the Bitcoin today, if you can think of five, 10 years from now, you're buying really early. Like I thought I was buying in late when I was buying in at 4,000, $5,000. Wow. Um, and now relatively, I feel like you were on the earlier side. Yeah. Relatively speaking. Exactly. Yeah. But there's people that were buying it at $300 that sold at a thousand and they're like, well, I three X my money. I'm good. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not just an investment like an Apple stock, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't tell people not to buy Apple stock. But what I say is understand that you have these different buckets and Bitcoin is the only thing that 
that uh, Jerome Powell or Joe Biden or Donald Trump or, you know, Klaus Schwab from the WEF, who's like the mm-hmm. evil, evil dictator of the world or Justin <laughs> Trudeau. He's th- that's but Bitcoin is the only thing that they can't take away from you. They mm-hmm. could come to your house with guns and take your gold. Yeah, they could right. find it. They could right. crack your safe open. They could take it. Mm-hmm. Um, some people might get shot depending on what part of Texas or Louisiana <laughs> you're in, but like, you know, there's the, it, you can't repo it. So in right. that regard, it's really yours once you take possession of it and not yeah. like buying it, like buying it on Coinbase and leaving it there, but there's a method of taking possession of it where you have digital control over it mm-hmm. and you could hand that down after year after year after year. And you can even set up like uh, a 401k or an IRA mm. with it in there. So it's it's really complex, but like anything complex, it just it just really requires time. You have to put the time in. Yeah. And people don't see the benefit in America because they're like, oh, I have a job, I have cash, da 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 da. But if like the banks blow up, like if so you were a Silicon Valley bank, accepting cars paid for by Bitcoin. One hundred percent. Yeah, I have, sell have probably. You, have you sold any? Oh yeah, yeah. I probably sell a car every two, once or two, one or two, every one or two months for Bitcoin. No way. Yeah. So the store holds Bitcoin and pays the employees in Bitcoin and all that stuff. So awesome. Yeah. So we have like, uh, 80 or 90 people that are Bitcoiners at the store out of the hundred people. Are they? Because you've, well, we give it to them as part of a benefit. It's called the Bitcoin benefit plan. Yeah. Very cool. It's just time. It's like, it's progressive. Yeah. But I mean, and like I said, you count from the bottom up. So you have this Mm -hmm. much today, you get another 20 bucks, 30 bucks, and you add it like that, like a savings account. And Mm -hmm. that's a much better way to look at Mm -hmm. it, but it's sovereign money that no one else can take away. That's the key. So the book I recommend everybody read to understand where we're going is called the sovereign individual. It was written in like 1996 or 1998. Mm -hmm. And it's about the information age that we're a part of now and how the information age changes things. Like this guy's writing in the nineties and he says one day, your computer connection will be so good, you'll be able to work from the beach. So you will move <laughs> to a jurisdiction nice. that recruits you as a, as, a, as a worker, as a citizen. Mm-hmm. Why would you ever live somewhere if you can work remotely, you know, and, and live, why would you live in, you know, the upper peninsula of Michigan and deal with the winters they have if you're a forklift driver and you could log in, put your goggles on and operate the forklift from your secure internet connection with your thumbprint ID from Barbados. Wow. Why would you do that? Right. 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 So that's where we're going with some of these like certain types of jobs that you can, you can like augment. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that is the future of work Mm -hmm. in the same sense. A lot of us work from home here and there. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have more information so you can make digital transactions happen faster. And the only way to pay the call center people in Delhi or the forklift, the virtual forklift driver in Barbados is Bitcoin. Because why right. would he want your trash dollars or trash rupees or whatever from your country that mm-hmm. they can just do this on? And mm-hmm. as these currencies like the Argentinian peso, the Lebanese lira, I think it is a pound, Turkish lira, they've completely imploded in the last like 12 months. And we're sitting here going like, dude, hyperinflation is real. It doesn't mm-hmm. just happen in Africa. It's happening mm-hmm. in these other places. Mm-hmm. So anyways, if you're suspicious about money, it's it'd be good to dig in on, on Bitcoin. Yeah, and, good to know. Say all so you've referenced a few books, like in just the short amount of time we've been talking. Do you read a lot? I don't read as much as I should. That okay. sounds weird. But I once I read a book, I've, I've, I'm, I've, I've retained it. Yeah. So I have a really good memory. Um, when I injured myself, this is like, so skipping ahead to the baseball time, the reason why I read yeah. so much is because even when I was a little kid, I understood that it, there's knowledge that people have put into the universe, right? Mm-hmm. And um, before the internet, there was only books. That was it. Right. You had books and VHS tapes. Mm-hmm. That was effectively it. So once YouTube came out and people were putting, or in like Instagram or whatever, you, I can learn how to cook like a dish that I've never even tried before just by watching, watching video. YouTube videos yeah. now. So I could learn how to play a song on the piano from watching a video. Mm-hmm. And if I just stick with it and I have this in front of me, I can play it. So why why would I turn that down? Someone's put this effort out there mm-hmm. and, and they've, they've written a message for the future. Mm-hmm. That's what a book is mm-hmm. effectively. So when you read these things, uh, especially ones like that are important to you or your cause or whatever it is, or you think about protecting your family with these different skills that you want to develop, mm-hmm. uh, not just knowledge like reading to read. Reading to read is great. But um, if you look at it as to say there's a homework assignment and I must learn one new skill a year, yeah. I must do one difficult thing, I must learn how to do this aspect of myself and get this one thing better. I mean, by the time you're 40 or 50 years old, like how many books have you theoretically read and mm-hmm. how much stuff do you know and why are you that much more worldly? Because mm-hmm. not everybody can afford to go to the Acropolis in Greece and see it. 
true. But you can read about it and read about, Mm -hmm. you know, all these different things. And like you can read about the history of Italy or the history of Greece or Turkey or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you could read that because someone has written about it. And they might have written about it 50 years ago or a thousand years ago. Right. um, But it's all valuable information to give you perspective on how we got here. Right. So let's rewind a bit because you mentioned as a child. I want to know more. I mean, we're friends. We've known each other for a while. Yep. Just trying to think about the first time we actually were introduced or met. I believe we met at a charity event in 2017 or 18. Okay. Either um, the uh, it was it was either the, the March of Dimes or Make a Wish or something like Make that. Make a I Wish, feel like. probably. Yeah, yeah, or Marjorie Mason. You were used to be involved. Things. Are you still involved with March of Dimes? I've done a lot of stuff with like those things. I personally donate now. It's just yeah. been tough, like because we get stretched in every direction. I'm you sure. know, like I don't really know what to do, and I've tried to spread around and rotate to different charities and stuff, but it's. Yeah. It's really difficult with the kids and stuff for me to actually make appearances places sometimes sure, because right? they're always at night mm-hmm. and it's like if we don't have a babysitter now we have four kids it's just like I'm just building the kid the kid farm as an excuse <laughs> it's like a moat no, I don't have to do anything I got four deal. kids man you, you can't make me go to this kids. thing That's yeah amazing you got three it's the same thing it's, I know it's chaos but so fun yeah like I grew up in a big family I feel like your house is the place to be mm. you know with having a big family it's just fun there's a lot of action your kids will have friends over all the time as they mm-hmm. get older. Um, so two daughters, two sons. Yep. Valentina is seven eight. and a half. Okay. Seven. Katarina's almost six. Yep. Max is two and a half. Yep. And Dominic is, well, he'll be seven months old. Love that you guys went for that fourth. Cause our kids are, <laughs> our kids are the same ages other than Dom throws yeah. a- added to the mix. We, sweet. well, we were at your house for a barbecue, right? Yeah. And, and you were like, I don't know, man, three, we're done. And, and yeah. Liz and I were like, should we tell her? Should we not tell her? <laughs> Cause we already knew I at love that point, that. you know, no, it was kind of funny. It. It's so great. You guys, it's the best. It's the best. And the boys have each other. Mm-hmm. Girls have each other. And I'm sure Although all Max are... is like side eye on Dominic right yeah. now. He's like, he's crawling. I don't he's know. I don't like, like this progress. Yeah. I bet you Dom will go straight to walking. I was talking to Liz about that the other day because yeah. he's very active and she was saying he's trying to crawl on his like feet, get on his feet. Yeah, he does like a pike position, like yeah. a downward dog. And Liz is such a wizard at, at like the child rearing thing now. She's like she got is. him to crawl so quickly because she figured out that if you, it's a parenting tip, you can splice this. <laughs> parenting tips. Um, if you put your hands very lightly on on the calves, like on their ankles or their calves okay. or whatever, they can't lift up and do the stink bug. They have to drag the their legs. Bug. So then they actually figure out yeah. the circular kind of locomotion, like alligator crawl that they need mm-hmm. to do. And um, so he went from like attempting it and she's like, oh, what if we do this? And then like now he's just crawling oh, around. He's so he's like all over the place it. now. Oh, but he's God. tried to stand up on me today. Oh, uh, yeah, I was playing I'm with him you. this morning and he put his hands on my chest and like stood up and he was like all wobbly. And I was like, oh, God, okay. what is this Here kid doing? Go. Here we you go. Know? Yeah. He's just trying to keep up with his siblings. For sure. And it's it's way easier, as you know, when you have yeah. other people to share that learning experience with. It's sweet. And, you know, I think everything, you, you benefit from that. I, I had one brother growing up. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I can't... Okay, so you're older or younger? I'm the older brother. You're yeah. the older. Okay. Yeah. How much younger is he? 18 months. Like, so almost you're exactly. you're in age. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, he's an artist. He lives in LA. He has one, one son uh, named Chase. It was really funny because him and his wife, uh, they didn't want to tell us what they were naming their son. Yeah. They, like, kept it a secret. And yeah. I'm like, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to, like, steal your name. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to like, yeah. like, we've thought about it. Liz and I have thought about it. And we have right. a completely different set of influences, uh-huh. you know, because Liz is Brazilian. And so we have to like name the kids stuff that can actually be pronounced in Portuguese. Yeah. So we no well, R's. You've done a great job. No R's in the names. We can't do that oh, for, the, you yeah. know, like Katarina kind of makes sense because they can say. But even the way Liz says it, I can't even, I can't even duplicate it. It's right. Like it's, yeah, it's very, sexy yeah, there you cool. go. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah like, you know. I can't. Yeah, so it's yeah. cool. But, um, you know, so uh, Maximus, uh, that that literally is, like, Max sounds like a race car driver name, and it sounds like Which a kind of a so great. tough guy. But Maximus is such a solid name. What's Liz's favorite movie? Um, Matrix. Gladiator. Gladiator. Oh, really? Maximus. Yeah. Wait, Russell Crowe, yes. Her favorite movie yes. is Gladiator. Yes, that's why Stop. his name is Maximus. Okay. Yeah, and what's one of my favorite movies? Yeah. The Matrix. Okay, that's, so that's what why, I thought. That's I why like his you... middle name is Neo. Yeah. Neo. The I one. knew there was a Matrix influence in yes. there. That's why I was yeah, like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh, and his so, middle name is Neo. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Oh so, my God. So cool. We, we wanted to have, um, you know, strong consonants as the start, you know, and yeah. l- her name is La Sala, mm-hmm. right? So it has mm-hmm. to, so the girls had to have pretty names. So we were like, Gorgeous. we had like yeah. a, I don't know, 
like a fa- uh, fantasy football draft board, and we had like a hundred <laughs> names. So we're like, don't nope, you nope, feel nope. like that's half the battle? Is yes. as a couple is agreeing on the name. A hundred percent. I felt that way. It was so fun. It was fun. I vividly remember we were driving down to L.A., Michael and I, pregnant with our first. And I was like, okay, we're driving. He can't go anywhere. He can't change the subject. I've he got can't him. get distracted. Captured. I've handcuffed. Got him He's handcuffed captured. to the wheel. Yeah. And we were literally going on the grapevine. And um, I, I remember, I'm like, okay, so let's talk names. And, and it, we did. And that's how we chose Gwen's name. And we, she was, that was the first name on my list. I had a list. Yes. Crazy like that. That's nothing um, wrong with that. And he agreed. And I just remember like, and some of the ones he suggested, I was like, no, no. And, right. and probably same here, you know? Um, but I vividly remember agreeing on that drive. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking at two West two and three came along. I'm like, oh man, it was hard enough to agree on one. How yes. are we going to agree on multiple? We literally had... We we forced we did like an NCAA tournament and it was like a hundred <laughs> names, All elim- the names eliminate to sixty yeah. names yeah. and like she gives me a sheet and I got to cross out like twenty of them I and I give her it. a sheet she gets to cross out twenty of them and this Amazing. was like before we knew if it was a boy or a girl so we had like a final like an mm-hmm. elite eight on like boy and girl names. Oh my god, amazing. And she kind of, she, it was funny because there was this one name that she kept trying to throw in the mix. And I'm like, that's not <laughs> happening. It sounds like a pasta. Can't blame her for trying. Though. No, no, no. It's, yeah. it's great. And so, uh, you know, her and I are very similar in the sense that we feel like there's a, uh, there's a responsibility for the parent to make sure that their kid gets off to a good start. Love and, that. you know, um, so the name is a part of that and mm-hmm. how you project what that name means and why mm-hmm. you're naming your child that is kind of cool. But. Um, there's influences for sure. Yeah. And there's people that, uh, whether it's fictional movie characters or real life, you know, heroes or something like that, or villains that you're like, we cannot name our kid <laughs> oh, for that. Sure. Cause that girl oh, was the hoe sure. and we're not calling her that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> My, Michael literally said something similar. He's like, I never realized how many people I hated until I had to name my child. Exactly. It's so bad. Yeah. Because it's like, no, that it's kid so picked on bad. me in school. Like, yeah. screw that kid. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you can't. So, Valentina, Katerina, Maximus, and Dominic. Yep. Does he go by Max? I've always called him Max. Does he go by Maximus or Max or both? Uh, well, it's the classic thing when you're happy with, hey, Max. And yeah. It's like, Maximus, Maximus, get over here. You know what I mean? So, so cute. Um, he knows his name as both. And so he understands like he's got, you know, the first name and the, and the short name or whatever. Mm-hmm. The girls go by their initials. So they just go by K and V and that's yeah. it. Although with their friends too, like I knew at home, but yeah, cute. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, uh, Hey, we're, can V come over to play? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think intentionality is the secret to everything. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think you can live with every decision you make on purpose is a good way to say it. And so Love in the that. same sense of like, you know, you get married on purpose, you mm-hmm. buy a house on purpose, you buy a car on purpose, name your kids on purpose, then, you know, you, you teach on purpose, you a parent on purpose and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's draining in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is a lot of work for mm-hmm. all of us. Um, and it's tough, but we couldn't do it without, uh, like a, a being a team, mm-hmm. you know, it's, you I guys are a great team, great parents. Your children are amazing. You're, we, doing, you're doing great. We have our moments and we have, we have these discussions where we're like, okay, we need to figure this out because we'll have a, a plan or a, 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 like a question and we'll be kind of not, not debating, but there'll be a gray area and her mm-hmm. and I will like circle the problem together and say, okay, what about this? What about that? And we really talk through everything. That's so great. Um, that's because when we first started dating, right, I wasn't sure how well she spoke English and how what her mastery was. Yeah. I knew she was smart because she was able to speak around it, but Liz had a very thick accent when we first started. Cute. Very, very sexy and cute, you know, yeah, like different. Yeah, I love that. But, so how'd you meet? I want to know. Uh, we met through a, a friend of mine. Um, he actually interviewed her and was like, hey, you need to meet this chick and uh, sends me a photo of her. And I'm like, well, she's really attractive, but what am I supposed to do with this information that there's a really attractive person? Like, I, you know, yeah. she lives in New York. I live in L.A. Like, what am I supposed to do with this info? Yeah. Um, and he goes, oh, you'll figure it out. You'll find a way. And then he like linked us on Twitter, like copied me as a reply in her interview that he posted or something like that. And um, I was like, oh, Jimmy, some of your best work, you know, so it's really funny. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so he's, so he's remember. responsible for, for all of this. It's, it's kind of And his. then how'd you end up actually meeting if you were on opposite coast? Yeah. She was out in LA for work at some point okay. and, uh, she posted a photo, 
uh, there's like, so Liz was a model for a long time and she was shooting for, I think it was like Maybelline at the time for mm-hmm. some sort of like, you know, I don't know, beauty campaign for like eyeliner or something like that. Yeah. And, um, she posted a photo of like this really iconic Los Angeles house. And as a architectural fan personally, and as a photographer, I knew that house. I knew where that house was. I lived a mile away from there. And oh, I was wow. like, so I, that was the first time I ever DM'd her. I had never DM'd her and we had been, um, you know, like following each other since like maybe November or something like that. And this was now like January 31st or whatever. So this is like two or three months later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, hey, are you in Los Angeles like right now, right now? And she goes, yeah, I'm working at this house. Do you know where it is? I said, I live a mile away from there. I'm, I'm, you know, renting a place in Beverly Hills. And this was um, in between playing for the Rangers and the Angels that off season. And uh, I was so nervous. So I, of course, I was like, I felt like Joey from Friends, you know, I was like, I got to be cool. So I I got on my, I got on my motorcycle. I rode my motorcycle over there because she had posted something about my goal for 2012 is to get my motorcycle license. And I was like, I'll help you with that. That's a girl. Yeah. And um, because Liz has that same kind of mindset of always improving herself and looking at these different skills. Mm -hmm. So one of her best friends, uh, she met like in kickboxing class in when she was living in New York, you know, because she was there to like work on her fitness or you know work on her i don't know i mean i guess i i at one point i was like are you a spy you're like good at everything this is kind of scary um because we met a couple years after mr and mrs smith came out so i was like i was like are we gonna like shoot guns and do karate in the (laughs) kitchen like what's going on here but um so there's always been a little bit of that and that that's that's been fun but she's very adventurous and so um anyway she was in la she agreed to meet i rode i rode to this house where it was and i waited there for like 40 minutes and i was like am I getting catfished right now? Yeah. Is, is she a bot? So like what's like, going what on? Yeah. So then I, as I start to leave, she yeah. like comes out and she's like, Hey, I'm on break. Sorry. Like da da da. So we talked, yeah. I was like, Hey, let's go to dinner. She's like, I'm sorry. I don't date strangers. I was like, I'm just going to go right off a cliff. Thank See ya. You know. Bye. And I just, <laughs> so then I sent her flowers to the, cause she didn't say where she was staying, you know, good move by the way. But I kind yeah. of deduced where she was staying. Obviously I didn't know what room or anything. So I just sent it to the front desk copy her name so they delivered it to her room so i sent her flowers and she was like oh man that's really nice you actually seem like a gentleman not some like weird creepy guy so uh (laughs) maybe maybe we can go on a date you know so we went on a date we talked and she was like listen here's the deal uh (laughs) like i'm from a family i'm from a big family i want a big family like i don't want to mess around with stuff like i'm if you're if you're just trying to get like a brazilian notch on your belt a stamp in your passport i'm not into that (laughs) so she like laid down the law like right out of the gate amazing with a thick accent and with you know and i was like wow she's actually really sharp and Mm -hmm. but she knows exactly what she wants and that's what was really attractive to me was that she knew what she wanted and um i was i don't know i i been dating other people and stuff so i'd been through some ups and downs in relationships and so i recognized right away that this was somebody that i could really like Mm -hmm. i could really count on this person because she's so firm in her beliefs Mm -hmm. that i was like okay this person's predictable Mm -hmm. and as a baseball player you know it's difficult because you're traveling a lot so you need to know the other person is like you need to know what the other person is really up to yeah well and but yeah you you, the trust is built up on their set of values i guess Mm -hmm. so we had very parallel values we wanted the same thing so Amazing. I was like, I like motorcycles, um, but I want to have a bunch of kids. And yeah. she's like, I like motorcycles too, <laughs> and I like racing. So she's like, what's baseball? She had no idea. She had no idea. And that was great because then I realized this girl, she did, she's, she's not, not like, not like a cleat for, chaser. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it really, I it's, love that. Yeah. It's so innocent. And, and like living in Texas was funny because um, when you live in Dallas, if you play for the Mavericks or the Stars or the Cowboys or the Rangers, mm-hmm. there's like not a lot of other things going on. It's not like L.A. Yeah. There's there's always there's always real celebrities in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's Leo. Entertainment. There's, there's yeah. There's, there's Justin Bieber aspect. or whatever. Good point. So yeah. as a as an athlete, unless you're playing for the Lakers, which is really the biggest big show, mm-hmm. you, you're never really on the top. You're you're not in tier one in the dating pool. Like you oh, don't have people approaching you in yeah, that yeah. regard. Because they're chasing the celebrities. The, uh-huh. the, the cleat chaser girls are ch- actually chasing all the celebrities instead. What do you call it a cleat chaser? Cleat chaser. That's a thing. Yeah, that's a thing. Wow. It's a real thing. Wow. So, But in Dallas, they are. Yeah. Right? They, oh, I bet. That's so a it's really different. Good so you have point. to filter them. And I had a teammate, bless his heart, he said this to me. He's like, God, there's so many gold diggers and chasing mm-hmm. us down and stuff like that. And I was like, Yeah, it's a problem. Like, because mm-hmm. you have to be careful to make sure that they like you for you. I said, It's not that they date, they want to date you, because that's like a mutually agreeable term. Right. It's that they divorce you. And they take half your money your after money. the fact. Yeah. That's yeah. the one thing you want to avoid. Mm-hmm. And he goes, yeah, you're right. 
So anyways, I want to get a Lamborghini. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, yeah. So how do we transition that? Right? Yeah. And yeah. so that's, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's what funny. you deal with, with a lot of baseball players where they, they, they understand one aspect of mm-hmm. the problem, but then they're creating the problem themselves. Truth. You know, Truth. and that you was know, the what's thing. that about? I guess he just didn't care. He's a, he's, he's a, he's a special guy. Do you still keep in touch with any of your teammates? A couple of them. Yeah. yeah. Instagram makes it easy. I bet. You know, text makes it easy. We have group, yeah. group text with some guys, but I don't do fantasy football or anything. So if I did, then so this, they do a lot of them do. They That's love it. Funny. Yeah. Cause I've just, I like the sports that I like. I like baseball and I like racing. I don't mm-hmm. really, I mean, I like hockey a little bit, but mm-hmm. I don't really follow the football at all. And mm-hmm. as a result of that, um, that's like the number one pastime for most baseball players in the off season because the football season coincides directly with True. our off season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. their thing is they like watching football and mm-hmm. hanging out with their friends. And, and I just, r- Sundays are for racing in my house. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I want to be doing. Love that. Know? So I feel like there's so much to talk about CJ. I don't even know where to begin. Well, let's go back sure. to like, you're not originally from Fresno. You said so- SoCal. Yeah. Huntington Beach area, right? From Huntington Beach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Grew up there. And then, um, so you how'd know, you get into baseball? Have you, did you play like as a child? Yeah. I, I, I but I didn't play T-ball or coach pitch. I didn't play until okay. it was kid pitch. And so I liked sports a lot. Mm-hmm. This is actually I mean, this is kind of funny mm-hmm. and it's great that we're on video for this part. Cause this is like a thing. <laughs> so I used to play basketball. I was really okay. into basketball, basketball and racing were my two things. And this is, so I was born in 1980. So okay. when I was six years old, uh-huh. right. My influences were Magnum PI top gun Obviously. and the Lakers. Yeah. Cause the Lakers were three peating, uh-huh. right. 87, 88, 89. They're in the finals, right. Magic right. Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It's like, this is the peak Glory of basketball days. in yes. Southern California. Yeah. And um, all, all due respect to Shaq and Kobe and all this other stuff, I was a child, and this was, you know, this that, was the, that, your, that was the period of time. Sure. Yeah. The Dodgers were in the World Series in 88, uh, so I understood baseball to a degree. Yeah. I didn't play baseball until 1989. So, so the reason yeah, I, so like eight or nine years old. Yeah, right? so I liked cars mm-hmm. at two. You did. I was into cars. Love Road it. and Track Magazine, Motor Trend, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I'd go to the doctor's office and like flip through the magazines and stuff. Love it. And I was into that. And so I asked the doctor, I said, hey, you're a doctor. You have money. What kind of car do you have? And he goes, oh, I drive a Honda. And I was like, <laughs> are you a loser? Like, what a loser doctor. Is This is my. Uh, this is me at two. Yeah. I'm like, why don't you have a, why don't you like have a, a Mercedes? Yeah, whatever. like you yeah. should have a Mercedes. You're rich, right? That's yeah. why. I, so I always thought the car was the toy of the wealthy guy. Mm-hmm. And the 80s were like the consumption decade. It was all about red and you mm-hmm. know success and suit and tie and like it was this thing that you know it was the people on tv it was magnum pi and miami vice and tom cruise and top gun so it was like fighter pilots and race car drivers and like macho manly men yeah. i was like well i want to be like that i want to be like james bond driving aston martin i want to be like magnum pi driving ferrari right so i loved cars and yeah. i built cars uh I, and my dad was in the air force before i was born and so he'd take us to air shows so i liked airplanes cool, yeah and so i was building fighter planes and all that stuff anyways so I liked cars and I wanted a Ferrari Testarossa and I'm of course, you know, like eight years old <laughs> and my dad's like, well, you could, you know, they're $120,000. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're going to have to pay for it. They don't just fall out of the sky. Right. And I'm like, well, okay, so what kind of job do I need to have? And he's At like, well, eight, you're, you're yeah, wondering this. this is me. This is like, this is the <laughs> definition of how I, how I was. And, um, you know, at that point, I, wa- I at that point, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So I wanted to fly in the Air Force. I want to fly F-16s. Mm-hmm. I want to shoot bad guys. I wanted mm-hmm. to protect America. Literally, gun, this is my dad, thing. I had a I had a flat top. I wore a green bomber yeah, jacket amazing. to school and jeans yeah. and like mirrored aviators. Like I have a picture of me on a motorcycle. I, say, I need photo evidence of this. It's literally like I wanted to be Maverick. Like That's that was the thing, amazing. you know. Yeah. But in the back of my head, I was always like, well, goose goose dies. Spoiler. Original, <laughs> original Top Gun goose dies. Um, so my dad goes, "Oh, we well, could be a lawyer." I'm like, "What do they do?" And he's like, "Oh, they argue for like their like, argue." <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah. You could be a doctor. I'm like, "Okay, well, like I know my doctor, but he drives a Honda, so obviously I can't be <laughs> that kind of doctor." He's like, "Well, you could be like a surgeon, and then you like cut people open and fix them." I'm like, "Oh, blood and guts, like that. Uh, no thanks." Thing. He's yeah. like, "Or oh, you could be, you know, this or that, like a psychologist, like your uncle, because my uncle in San Diego is like a psychiatrist or whatever." And I wrote a book about relationships called huh. The Passion Paradox in like the '80s, <laughs> and um. Uh, I was like, I don't want to listen to people's problems. And he's like, well, then, you know, your your uncle was like a semi-pro golfer for a while or a pro golfer for a while. You could try that. I was like, well, what about playing for the Lakers? And he goes, listen, 
<laughs> listen. Let's bring it back to reality. Let's go here. like this. And he goes like this. He goes, do you look like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? <laughs> I was like, no. He's like, do you look like Michael Cooper? I was like, no. He's like, do you look like Magic Johnson? And he's yeah. and I'm like, well, they're really tall, right? And he goes, yeah, they're like six foot seven, yeah. six foot eight. How tall are you? I'm six foot one. Okay. My dad is six foot one, right? Yeah. And he's like, listen, it, our family... <laughs> The jeans, we're not going to, we don't have NBA jeans. I'm just going to put it there. And I said, you're right. They look a lot different than me and they look different than you. And if I'm going to look like you when I'm older, if I'm going to be your height or whatever, how do I, how, how can I be taller or bigger than you? Cause mm-hmm. you know, you're, my dad's fairly, he's not like frail, but he's like, you know, he's like 160 pounds. He's like that, yeah. So, um, he's like, yeah, you're just going to, I was like, well, what about, what about baseball? I guess, you know, cause I was started to collect baseball cards and you flip over the oh, card nice. and you see this guy is six foot two, 210 pounds, yeah. five ten, one ninety, And you're like, oh, these are regular size people. Yeah. They're just regular size guys, mm-hmm. but they're just good. Okay. I'll play baseball. So nine-year-old year, play Little League. That was why. Because I wanted right. to get a cool car and have money to get a cool car. And I was like, well, baseball players make good money, so I'll, I'll just play Major League Baseball. Yeah. There was no discussion of, oh, the odds of this are slim. Wow. None of that. I had so never from played. from a young age, you were like, I'm going to go pro with this. Yeah, and that was I'm it. going for it. That was it. Wow. And my coach, my first coach, said, you suck. You should probably go play soccer because you can't hit and you're really erratic with your throwing and you're you're running fast and you have a lot of energy and you can mm-hmm. like catch the ball really well but you suck and then um i told him well i'm gonna be a major league all-star and he like taps me on the head and he's like okay son okay so i was like so determined to prove that, him wrong obviously. yeah 100%. chip on my shoulder big yeah. chip my dad gets me a book called uh the techniques of modern hitting and it was from wade boggs who at the time was a batting champion for the red mm-hmm. sox i read it then 10 year old year i'm the best player on the team Suddenly I'm hitting over 400. I'm like hitting lasers everywhere. And I'm still like, a, I'm a little kid. I'm not like a big, strong kid You're or anything. 10 like that. years old. No, but I'm saying relatively speaking, yeah, I was yeah. probably in the bottom 20% of size for mm-hmm. the kids. Like my freshman year of high school is 5'2", 105 pounds. Wow. So, wow. you know, yeah, I was little. Yeah. Um, but I was steady. I ate really mm-hmm. well. I worked mm-hmm. out a lot. And I just was like every day, every day. It was like prison workouts. You know, I'm in my room doing 100 push-ups, mad that someone, some other kid is better than me. And I had like a rival and I'd just be thinking like, I just have to be better than Andrew Rodriguez. I have to be better than Darren Surdock. I have to be better than Jason Zila. Like all these kids that I had like on my list. Wow. Like I had to assassinate them by passing them, you know, batting average, hitting more home runs, striking out more kids, whatever. So then I, I, that book helped me so much. Mm -hmm. I started reading other books. I read Nolan Ryan's Pitcher's Bible, Tom Tom Seaver's book, all these guys that were like Hall of Fame players. Mm -hmm. I started reading their books and then I started thinking like they think because like we're saying with authors, Mm -hmm. it's a message to the future, right? Right. But when you write something, it's literally what you're thinking. And if you read it, Mm -hmm. you're reading what that person's thoughts are there yeah so you're absorbing their thoughts mm-hmm. and you're if you can then translate that it's like this hourglass flips mm-hmm. and then suddenly you have a certain amount of time mm-hmm. to make it happen in real life what they've written down wow. and that's so that that like literally that visual inspiration i just looked at it like i'm just building myself up like legos and i just need to add this skill and this skill and the skill and wow. i was like 100 percent determined and so did you, know, you always think you wanted to be a pitcher though no I how'd you determine what position you wanted to really kind of focus on well i got drafted as a pitcher but i played outfield in college so you i played did. center field okay. right field first base i did everything i'm left-handed wow. so i was no, limited I know. Yeah. but um i was just very competitive and i wanted to help the team win and i was you know like the best hitter on the team and the best pitcher on the team and so i just wow. did both you know so most you, of the time i mean you, it took me time to like level up to that because mm-hmm. i wasn't physically the same size as everybody is always smaller until probably like junior senior year of high school Mm -hmm. and then i got mono my senior year of high school and lost like 27 pounds and then had to work my way back and then freshman year college i broke my back and then had to work my way back and then sophomore year state champion state player of the year you know the first award i'd ever really won in a singular sense like mvp of the league and the state Mm -hmm. kind of a cool deal get a full ride to go to loyola marymount um our team was terrible uh Got in lots of fights with the coach because he just didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. And we disagreed on stuff and I'm very self-motivated. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. And he had all these stupid limitations on on the way we were supposed to play. Like you weren't allowed to swing at curveballs until you had two strikes. So we were playing against advanced players and they're like throwing curveballs for strikes. And if you just sat there and took it, you'd, you'd be two strikes because they could mm-hmm. flip it in there. Yeah. And then uh, I remember distinctly I hit a home run on a changeup. So the guy throws me a changeup. I hit a home run 
and I run around third base and like the, the third base coach won't give me a high five. And I'm like, this is BS. Yeah, what? I don't know if we're allowed to cuss or not, but in my head, yeah, obviously, no. I said yeah. the full thing. Yeah. So I come in. All my teammates were like, dude, Homer, that was sick. And then <laughs> um, the coach goes, hey, what pitch was that? I was like, I'm pretty sure it was a changeup. He just threw it like waist high right down the middle. And he goes, yeah. cool, you're done for the day. I was like, and I was batting like cleanup. I was yeah. like the four, like, you know, one of the top hitters is wow. me and this kid, Chris Zacuto, that were like the best hitters on the team. Yeah. And um, he's like, well, you're not playing the rest of the day. I'm like, are you serious right now? He goes, you know the rules. No swinging at off speed until two strikes. I'm like, that's the stupidest rule well, in baseball. Why is that? Exactly. He just it's wanted to have control. Of the team. It he just, like this it. Napoleon yeah. complex that he yeah. just wanted to control things. And, and that he was didn't his know lesson anything. He was teaching you. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, he taught me that lesson. And so um, I got drafted in the fifth round. I never looked back. I got signed by the Rangers. And then I was just, you know, through the minors. And that was wow. it. But I'd been through a lot of adversity with these injuries and stuff, mm -hmm. so that I knew when I was healthy, I was like time to go yeah. and time to like hammer Made the it. Most of that yeah, time, exactly. Yeah. So, how did you decide to retire? Mm. That's kind of a funny story. I don't so, think I've ever, yeah, we've never. I uh, I had a five-year contract with the Angels. Mm -hmm. I got hurt in 2015. I needed elbow surgery, mm -hmm. and uh, recovering from that, like the reason why I know I needed elbow surgery is because my shoulder started hurting. I was like, oh, this is bad. It's starting to like get systemic, right? Yeah. So I have this problem where I can't straighten my arm out. So if you see like this is my left arm and this is my right arm. So I, I, I've got about, mm. what is, is that, like painful? a foot? A foot of range of motion that I can't, mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. move. So I can only oh, move wow. my arm in about 60 degrees of rotation as opposed to like. Like touching your Like shoulder. 150. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I've, I've, I'm missing about 80 or 90 degrees of rotation wow. uh, because of bone spurs, no cartilage, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um. I had had five arm surgeries along the way, mm -hmm. uh, first at 22 years old, then I had one at 27, and then another one at uh, 30, yeah, 30, and then another one at 34, or whatever. So um, I was, my, my contract was up, but, or that year, so 2016 was my last year with the Angels, mm -hmm. but during spring training, you know, it before I got to spring training, I said, hey, my shoulder hurts. I need to get it scanned. I need an MRI. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, you're fine. It's fine. No, no big deal. And I'm like, no, it's not fine. I've had a couple arm surgeries. Like, I know it's not fine. Yeah. Like, the and angels have this thing. thing. It's not like you want it to hurt. Yeah, I want to like, play. Hey, I'm here to, to, like, be, they're yeah. paying me a lot of money. I want to be on the field. Right, right. So they made what I called a business decision, a business medical decision, mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a, a winning percentage decision. Mm -hmm. And they let me, they, they tried to force me back onto the field mm -hmm. to, like, say like it wasn't a big deal so i'm out there and i like can't throw i'm like throwing like 80 miles an hour my arm is killing me i'm like listen i can barely lift my arm up after playing catch yeah. and like throwing like one bullpen session so then they they scan my arm in spring training so we've lost about six months now in my recovery period because right. if i would have got scanned they would have been like oh it's messed up you need to get fixed right they're like oh yeah, it's really messed up. You have a tear in your rotator cuff, a tear in your bicep tendon, yeah. and you have this other problem with your labrum. Yeah. And but if we rest it and we, you try some like injections or whatever, maybe mm -hmm. it'll go away and it won't be a big deal. Right. So I'm like, all right, I think you're wrong, but at least we know what the problem is, and um, we'll work towards some sort of recovery. Yeah. So then in like April of that year. I'm doing a rehabilitation start because I was I was building up strength and the advice that, that I got from the medical team there's two two sets of the medical team there's the team doctors mm -hmm. and the team physical therapist the team yeah. physical therapist is like listen you need to get jacked you need to eat as much as possible because mm -hmm. if you have a tear the only way it recovers is if you're eating too much and then it fills in mm -hmm. basically like rebuilds the t the tear mm -hmm. so just lift weights crank it up you know as hard as you can on everything as much mm -hmm. food as much intensity whatever sleep as much as possible drink as much water and then that's the only way this is going to have any chance of recovering mm -hmm. so i do that for like six or eight weeks i'm at like 226 pounds which is like easily 25 pounds more than i am today so i'm just like shrugging the house i'm just like doing everything yeah. i can to build everything around it you know because yeah. the shoulder is like a microphone it's like it it's got all these muscles holding it in mm -hmm. place and it has to move in all these different directions right right so I'm doing a rehab start in Lancaster or something like that. And uh, I threw three innings and I think I gave up like one hit and I struck out a bunch of guys and I was, wasn't was throwing very fast, but I could still pitch. You what know? was like your fat, like your, okay, this is a solid pitch. How fast was it? Uh, as a starting pitcher at the end of my career, like 93, you wow. know, but at the height of my velocity when I was a relief pitcher and just allowed to throw one inning, 97, you know, Dang. fastest pitch I ever threw was like 98 and that was to Ichiro in, in 2000 and, uh, wow. 2007 or 2009. 
Um, and it's, it's like a max effort thing. So for anybody that works out, like imagine doing like a one rep max squat, like as mm -hmm. heavy as you can do it mm -hmm. as fast as you can. That's what it feels like to throw wow. as hard as you can. So wow. in that start, I throw three innings and they're like, Hey, we want you to go back out for a fourth inning. I'm like, dude, my shoulder is killing me. I can't. Mm -hmm. So I go out there and literally rip my bicep tendon off the bone in like I felt it happen and it was yeah. so awkward it was so weird so you have two bicep tendons that's yeah. the bi right so you have one that goes like into the top of your clavicle and then one that goes up at the top up up mm -hmm. here like into your more into your shoulder so I tore the one I tore one of them and I literally couldn't pick up my arm like that was it I was like like if you would have lifted my arm up I couldn't hold it I like literally was couldn't it hold. So painful. Yeah, it was horrible. It was terrible, and I'd already had four arm surgeries at this right. point, right? And so I already, already knew, knew what a bad arm wrong. felt like. Yeah. And uh, and so I go in there and I stare right at the coach, and I'm like, I'm like, who told you to do this? Mm -hmm. He's like, they told us to send you out there no matter what for the fourth inning, and I was like, I told you I can't do this, mm -hmm. and they're like, we're sorry, and I'm like, I need shoulder surgery now. Mm -hmm. So we go in, do full sh shoulder surgery. Uh, the doctor I. It was like, hey, this is your recovery period. You know, you'll probably be able to play next year if you go for it. But you have to be careful. Just, you know, work your way up. So you be careful as a pitcher? It's not easy. Yeah, because you you're know? literally throwing as hard as you can. Yes. So all 2016 then, I'm rehabbing. I'm in Scottsdale, Tempe, mm -hmm. doing our rehab stuff down there. And um, I'm ready to go for 2017. But so at this point, you were planning on going back. Yeah, planning on going okay. back. And then... Um, I was looking at buying a really cool car uh, or buying a car dealership. You know, I had like a, a little bit of money saved up and I was like, okay, I want to do one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what it looked like was I was going to buy this car called the McLaren F1, mm -hmm. which is like the pinnacle of modern cars. And um, I was going to sign with the Padres. That was like my plan. So the Padres were talking to me and I was talking to their pitching coach and their general manager who I knew from Texas. Mm -hmm. And they were going to come watch me like in a couple of days, throw a bullpen or something. And I was fully recovered. I was like ready to go. Okay. Throwing, throwing the ball th over 300 feet in practice and like throwing probably 90 miles an hour again off the mound. Mm -hmm. So I was good. And they do these things where they sign a player to like a small base contract. And then if you stay healthy, you get all these incentives. And so you make like way more. So you make like a lot of money. And that's... Yeah. That's kind of the enticement thing. So the Padres signed a player like while I was not really negotiating, but before, but that was, I was going to sign with them. If they were mm -hmm. saying, Hey, here's the minimum salary, but you can make this much. I would have been like, yes. Okay. San Diego is cool. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'll get a tan. You know, we have one kid at this point, right? Okay. Uh, we have, we have Valentina. We just had Valentina in spring training of 2016. Wait, okay. And so I was living in Newport beach, Corona del Mar. And I was like, okay, cool. Like my family's still around. I could like mm -hmm. San Diego sounds great. You know, it'd be nice. And um, they signed a player I didn't like. Mm. And I had been offered the stores here in Fresno. Mm. And um, I was like, well, I either play with this person who I f feel like is miserable. We don't like each other, and I don't mm -hmm. like him at all. And I played with him previously, and I don't want to be on this team. Right. Uh, or I can go invest my money in the dealership. Mm -hmm. you know, and then commit to that, be a dad, race some cars, you know, live, live locally in a nice big house. That's way cheaper than it is in orange County right. and, um, have a pretty good quality of life mm -hmm. and just accept my fate mm -hmm. and say, I've had five arm surgeries. I don't need a sixth, you know, cause it's always risk. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a race car driver and a dealer owner. And that was one choice or play with one more season and try to, for selfish reasons, effectively at that point. Because yeah. I knew I wasn't going to be uh, the same type of player I was in 2011 or 2012 or whatever. So I was like, okay, the team is not that good, realistically. This guy's miserable. Mm -hmm. He's going to make me miserable. I've got a kid. I want to focus on that. Right. I want to be there for my, my, my kids. Family, yeah. Okay, I'll do the car dealership thing. Mm -hmm. and I'll just pivot. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And then, um, it's a very mature decision though. Well, I you was know, like 30, of life, yeah, right? I was like 35, 36 years old. So yeah. I had been in the majors for 12 and a half years at that point. Mm -hmm. And, but what it came down to is I have a friend named Gene, he's a doctor, orthopedic surgeon from Houston. And he said, Hey, listen, like realistically, your arm is like effed hard. It's bad. Right. And you have so many bone spurs and no cartilage left in your elbow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can throw 90, 91, but like you might sever a nerve at some point from all those things. Like something breaks and severs mm -hmm. a nerve. He's like, then you won't ever be able to pick your kid up. I was going to say quality like, of life. Do you want to pick right? your kid up like this? Yeah. Or do you want to try to like hoist them right handed? Right. And I was like, that's bleak. So 
I felt like, hey, as a business owner, I can still have a financial path forward Mm -hmm. and I can be the dad that, I mean, realistically, I can have the family that I didn't have growing up. I can have the quality of life I didn't have growing up and I can provide that for my wife and my my family. Your family, yeah. My wife goes, Fresno? I know, right? What? What was her reaction? (laughs) Yeah. San Diego or Fresno. Yeah. Mm. And we were living in Corona del Mar. So it was, yeah, it was beautiful. a tough sell for her. So yeah. I didn't really sell it to her. I just said, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. We didn't have a discussion. Amazing I was opportunity like, we're going. Yeah. And and she pro- I mean, here's the thing. Feet dragging. Unless you know somebody that lives here, Fresno is not necessarily a destination yet. Hopefully it will be eventually. I knew nobody. But you know, unless you're driving through, which I got often, mm. or you know somebody here, why would you come? You know? You had to buy a car for me or go exactly. eat it, go eat right. at one of these awesome restaurants we have or something <laughs> yeah. like that, realistically. Yeah. No, it, I mean, I say that, you know, at the time, though, I feel like that it's getting better. Obviously, we have a lot more to do and close to a lot of things. But so you had never you had never personally been to Fresno before this. Uh, I had never I mean, I had visited movie. Fresno. Um, I had been to Yosemite once or twice with my mm-hmm. friends. I had played in the state championship here at Fresno City College one time in, oh, okay. in 2000. Uh, so yeah, no, I knew nobody. Right. I just toured it. I drove around and mm-hmm. I drove up and down Van Ness and I was like, whoa. And then this I looked at wild. Zillow and I was yeah. like, wait, that's all these houses cost. This is crazy. I like know. this is awesome. That in Orange County or SoCal? completely different. Yeah. It's five totally times more expensive right? down there. And yeah. so, yeah, that was, that was like, well, listen, it doesn't matter how much how my house is worth. It matters how cool it is. And it <laughs> matters like, you know, if my wife and I are really going to have kids, we need mm-hmm. a big house mm-hmm. to do all this stuff. And right. it's right down the street. The Financially, the dealerships have a lot of upside because they were really underperforming. And the people I've met, I was like, okay, cool. So it's farmers and doctors. And like, that's the majority of my clients here. Mm-hmm. Then business owners. I'm like, that's cool. I can drive with that. Yeah. And I just took the plunge based on my passion for the car brand. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd been in the car business for like, I guess, five years at that point. Um, oh, you had? Okay. Yeah. My first car dealership was 2012, but that was because I started a racing team in 2009. Yeah, well, so while I was I still playing. We need to talk about that too. Uh, it's, it's not much to say. I, if, if you, if you like racing, yeah. eventually you get roped into some sort of race car ownership mm-hmm. and then it's like an Airbnb. You're like, oh, if I get a couple of these, I can rent them out and then like generate revenue somehow. Interesting. But just like an Airbnb, like it can go sideways pretty quickly mm-hmm. once people start crashing your cars thrashing right. your houses it's sort of so then i started my own team mm-hmm. and then i had managers for that and then kind of a couple different iterations but we ended up like winning championships and stuff and it was That's pretty amazing. cool i have trophies for race wins yeah. and all that stuff what and type of cars we started with mazda miatas worked nice. our way up to porsches and then eventually wow. went to the uh, gt3 level which at the time was an acura nsx and we had one of two acura nsx race teams and then i sold the race team in 2018 mm-hmm. after i retired because the owner, oh, the, the operator of the racing team really had a good relationship with Honda. And I was like, hey, listen, I'm a Porsche guy at the end of the day. Right. And if, unless they're going to give me a Honda dealership, like why am I racing Hondas but selling Porsches at Audis and BMWs? It right. makes no doesn't, sense. Doesn't fit. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I kind of, you know, we parted ways. I sold the team off and then, uh, you know, took some assets out of it, meaning like I kept like the racing trailer and stuff. And then I traded cool. the racing trailer towards like a Ferrari team to get like some you know, coaching and like operational stuff. Cause racing is expensive, obviously. So I was like, Hey, if I give you guys this trailer, like, can you guys service my car and do some race stuff with me? So, so cool. I, I did that for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I just have a very extensive bucket list as a dreamer mm-hmm. and then racing was always on there. So racing's still on there. I know. Um, Tell me about your goal in racing now. Yeah. The goal is to go, you know, win some of these like world-class level endurance racing events mm-hmm. like Lamar or Daytona, mm-hmm. Sebring, stuff like that. Um, I'm, I'm off on that. I'm not on that path right now. I'm kind of off that path. I'm making some plans to get back on it, but Mm -hmm. without, you know, making the right business decisions at the dealership, Mm -hmm. it's just a big money pit. And so you have to find a way to correlate that. I imagine. Right. And you're already probably feeling like you need to be five places at once sometimes. Yeah. Well, going on. Right. But the the team aspect of the business the team aspect mm-hmm. of racing the team aspect of sports and parenting all that like it's all sort of thematic for me when i when i became a better team player mm-hmm. i was able to have better results because when you're playing selfishly or by yourself you don't really have the people that are willing to dive for the ball for you if they think you're a jerk this is kind of how it goes that's like really 
deep. <laughs> I feel like that was probably a lesson you had to learn along the way, right? I, I sort of learned it by accident because I spoke Spanish when I was in the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. And so I had teammates that were from the Dominican and mm-hmm. I'd speak Spanish with them. And then I noticed that they would play really hard behind me because I was nice to them. Whereas some of the other players that were from you know maybe the south or something like that that Mm -hmm. would say things that were offensive to these guys occasionally and refer to them in derogatory terms Mm -hmm. they had they they those some of those double plays didn't get turned right you know what i mean like some of those guys like they didn't really die for that ball you know the way they did with me and they wouldn't communicate because you have to you have to communicate in team sports so if i had a tendency to throw certain pitches guys would hit them to certain parts of the field so i'd move so we had a shortstop in Savannah named Jose Morbon, really talented player. Mm-hmm. I had said, Jose, I need you to play to the left a little bit, you know? And he'd be like, hey, I'm the shortstop, you're the pitcher. And I'm like, Jose, por favor, a la izquierda, mm-hmm. porque tiro a slider y el uh, batea allá. And he goes, okay, papi, <laughs> you know? So he takes one one or two steps to the left. Yeah. The guy hits it right where I think he's going to hit it. Mm-hmm. He kneels down picks it up throws a guy out of first base Mm -hmm. he looks like a genius so he looks like the genius right Mm -hmm. because he's the one that made the play that was a tough play to make Mm -hmm. but i prepped him for it i said this is what i'm going to do so i would tell the shortstop and the center fielder and the second baseman how to read my pitches so i would Mm -hmm. tell them what i was going to throw before i threw it and so when you have these conversations with the guys there it's the minor leagues yeah everybody wants to get to the majors right if the shortstop is good because you're tipping him off on what's going on he knows what's happening yeah He's going to make more plays. He's going to move up. Yeah. He got to the major leagues. So it's like by being a better teammate, you make a better team. And in these, that lesson, that specific lesson, I had a teammate that went to Baylor. Mm-hmm. He was completely clueless. And he was, he was one of those tone deaf people, yeah. um, which like everybody socially gets. Socially or what? Yes. Okay. So he goes, so he got drafted and got signed for like 900 grand. Okay. Um, which is really high. And a lot of people don't get that. So he's looking at yeah. this guy, Chris. He's like, well, yeah, Chris, I mean, like, we both went to college in Texas, but, you know, you were like a 25th rounder. So if you have, like, one bad season, you're going to get released. Whereas they gave me 900 grand. They've invested in me. I probably got three or four years to figure it out. Yeah. He's like, but, and he's like, Tom, he's like, you'll probably never make the majors because you don't throw hard enough. And I'm sitting there going, this guy, what the, what? <laughs> How do you say that to your teammate? That's the closer. You're telling me he doesn't throw hard enough? Like, right. he's going to save your ass. He's going to save the game and get you that win. Yeah. But uh, that guy never made it out of a ball because he had this sort of like Bradley Cooper wedding crashers vibe. (laughs) And he just thought everything was supposed to be like crab cakes and football and like everything was supposed to be easy for him. And he was not well liked and he he didn't work hard. He just was Mm -hmm. very entitled. He had Mm -hmm. like, you know, instead of white privilege, he had like a first rounder privilege or whatever, Mm -hmm. which we. So once you get to the minors, it doesn't matter if you sign for five grand or five million. Like if you suck, like you're going to get exposed. Right. And if you're good, you're going to move up. Mm-hmm. but he thought that he was he was guaranteed a slot at the, in the majors at some point. So, you know, you see these people make these mistakes in front of you, and you're like, mm-hmm. don't want to be like that guy. And, and so I mean, ultimately, it is a business at the end of the day. Yeah. Athletics, even the entertainment industry, I remember there were certain talent that we worked with that were – a-holes and if they don't show and up like for work not gonna, that yeah they're not reliable if they're treating mm-hmm. people disrespectful if they're horrible to work with they have crazy demands who wants to hire that person mm. or draft that person right. or play and work with that person so mm. i mean what a concept to be kind to people it's weird <laughs> well it just to meet people where they're at also True. Right? and say like yeah. hey you do this thing i think if you tried this aspect of it you might even be better than you are now mm-hmm. and and with with sports there's a lot of that tweaking but now yeah. in sales it's the same thing because i get to read like a creep i get to read everybody's emails so when somebody submits a lead on a car and they say mm-hmm. oh i want to buy this car i'm interested in the price and you see a salesperson send like a crappy response mm-hmm. i immediately go to the salesperson and be like did you think before you hit enter on this one yeah, like right. you hit send Did you proofread this? Like, what are you doing? And because I want that guy to do better. It's a commission business. So he loses if he doesn't sell. But this guy's sending an email to Fremont, to Fresno, to uh, Pleasanton, to Mm -hmm. Bakersfield, to San, you know, like this guy's not a unique situation. If you have a white car with a black interior, they probably have those everywhere else. Right. So it's whoever's the nicest and treats you the best. Mm -hmm. And so as a client, you know, uh, I got into the car business in a way because I was a car buyer. And so I'm in my twenties right. playing in the major leagues, buying cool cars, you know, like 
young and dumb spending too much money, the mm-hmm. classic thing. Mm-hmm. But when people would treat me like crap, I was like, well, you should probably be very careful about this mm-hmm. because one day I'll have more money and then you're missing out on all those sales. Oh, no, that's true. And so I developed that kind of mindset because I worked at Nordstrom's. Hmm. And so when I was in the minor leagues making mm-hmm. no money, I worked at Nordstrom's, learned how to sell, learned how to talk to people, cool. ask them questions, and really kind of get them what was their fit. Mm-hmm. Because if you like come in, if you're like shopping, I tell everybody this, if you're shopping in July and uh, you buy a leather jacket, you have to buy that on sale, knowing that you need it later. You don't right. need a leather jacket in July. True. So if the salesperson sells you that and they make you stretch to buy it, you get a big commission on an expensive leather jacket at, at Nordstrom's. Right. But if you, but if they return that, because you can return anything at Nordstrom's, if they bring it back, you've lost. Oh, really? Yeah, you, you don't make any money. There's they no commission. They revoke the commission if they return an item. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. I didn't realize that. So you need to sell someone a polo shirt, a pair of pants, Something a pair of socks. Something wear and... An outfit. Yeah. So you got to kind of be like a consultant for these people. Yeah, and it's yeah. the, So that mindset versus the sell me this pen, mm-hmm. Wolf of Wall Street salesperson, <laughs> two totally different things. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot more consistency when you build the trust and you sell someone. You're like, oh, are you like a... You're like, what are you, like a 40 long? Like, let me get you some like 36 pants, 36, 32 is probably your size. Yeah. Like when you can do the, the uh, like the county fair assessor thing, like mm-hmm. what are you, man, of a buck 85? When you can do that, <laughs> then you can you can get people's trust and you can, you know, so right. if like a woman walks in and she's like, hey, I want to buy something for my husband for Father's Day, right? Yeah. Okay, well, how are you going to help her? Right. How big is your husband? How right. tall is he? What colors does he like? What colors are already in his closet? Right. How do you match all these things together? Does he wear a lot of black and white? We're a lot of earth tones. Right. So it's like, you know, you're not going to sell somebody like some crazy stuff that he's never going to wear. Mm-hmm. Is he conservative? Does he golf? Da, 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 you know, right. so, all the things. Anyways. So, so that's always carried with me since yeah. that experience. But that was because I saw people do it well and do it poorly. Mm-hmm. And I had experience with both. And you were observing and you're like, OK, well, it's commission based. There's money on the line. Yeah. If you do it well, you get paid. It's like yeah. a great incentive, you know. Clearly. Yeah. So. So you come to Fresno. Did you start with the three dealerships, BMW, Audi, and Porsche? Mm-hmm. Okay. So speaking of relationships, team building, connections, mm-hmm. what was that experience like for you coming to Fresno, having known no one really, right? Terrifying. Right? Terrifying. I didn't know anything. I knew everything about the cars. I right. loved the cars. Which is great. You're knowledgeable. You have that, obviously, and many things going for you. But like, how was that? Building relationships, meeting people, introducing, like introductions. The, I'm always curious by yeah. people who aren't from here yeah. and move here. The best thing you can do when you get into a new business is mm-hmm. fire the bad people immediately. Yeah. The if toxic. You, yes. You mean? Yeah. So the, the guy that was the general manager of the Audi and Porsche store was actually like holding deals over salespeople's heads and like, yeah. a, like a crook. So what he would do is he'd say, hey, I have this car that's going to pay a lot of commission if I sell it but I'm a size 11 in Gucci. And Stop. so you need to get me a pair of shoes. Yeah. Otherwise you're not going to get this because a commission for selling a big expensive car, mm-hmm. two or three grand yeah. for a salesperson, yeah. $600 a set of shoes. You're sitting there thinking, well, okay, I net 1400 out of it. Maybe I need to do this. I found out about this guy was gone yeah. a week into ownership. Mm-hmm. I found out about this guy's gone immediately. Good for you. you know, Good for uh, you. so then I became the general manager Mm-hmm. And I was not prepared for that. And you were just, yeah. I was over my head. Overwhelmed. And I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. I just had to learn. Right. And Anne Zimmerman, our CFO, mm-hmm. um, she is an absolute wizard. Mm-hmm. And she's been in the car business a long time. And so she becomes like my mom. Mm-hmm. And I go into her office and I, you know, drink a water or root beer, like literally, <laughs> I like root beer, <laughs> or ginger ale. And then I would sit there and ask her questions about the car business. And then I would stay from, you know, Eight thirty nine 9 in the morning until 9, 10, 11, 12 at night, mm-hmm. reading, learning, reading, learning, like looking at the statements, figuring things out, reading through everything, trying to teach myself all these Quite, systems yeah. and softwares and stuff I had never even dreamed of right. needing to know. I, mean, I thought I was going to be, right in, right? I thought I was going to be the owner and be like, yo, easy street. Hey, we're selling some cars today. Good. I'm going to go <laughs> do some racing. See you guys right? in three days. Right? I didn't think I was going to be on the ground, actually boots on the ground in the trenches doing it. Right, right. So when I was forced to do that, I kind of petitioned to Audi and Porsche uh, to help me, Mm -hmm. you know. And so what they did was they sent in consultants to coach me on how to be a general manager. And they Mm -hmm. put me through like little mini schools. And it was very valuable. Very cool. And it allowed me to learn how the politics of the car business work Mm -hmm. with the factories, which is another West Wing type of thing. (laughs) Sure. And um, but then also just by being there. And the volume of people coming in and just walking around and being present, they're Mm -hmm. like, wait. 
wait, are you the baseball guy? And I was like, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, like, I'm just, do you want an Audi A4? You know? So yeah. I had to learn, yeah. like, on my feet, sink or swim, you know, this is either the best financial decision or we're going to go bankrupt if this doesn't work yeah. situation. You, you don't have the personality to fail, though. I feel like you were determined to, we're doing this. Uh, I mean, I've definitely failed at stuff. I've, <laughs> I've started stuff. I've, you know, I've sold businesses that, that weren't well, but I think in general, if I'm involved in something, I'm willing to go way further right. than I should mm, yeah. in order to get something there. But mm -hmm. what I tell everybody, anybody that's a business owner, the, thinking about becoming a business owner, the first thing that happens when you become a business owner, when you either buy a business or start a business, mm -hmm. you go broke, sure. you go underwater. And then there's like this swing down where you're learning and you're mm -hmm. figuring out how the business works and then eventually you get back to zero. And then at that point you just, you either, you look at the trajectory and you're like, okay, am I swinging fast enough to mm -hmm. like break financial gravity? Have I learned the lessons that I need to learn? Mm -hmm. And have I become the business owner I need to be? Um, where are the little, where are the leaks? Mm -hmm. And then you start, you, you can't fall in love with the projections. You have to look at what's really happening. Right. And, I was taught along the way by a couple of really good consultants in the business and stuff like that. Uh, but keep in mind, this is not like none of my family was in the car business. I didn't like I know, inherit right? anything. Like I just, for cars, I just like cars passion for the brands, but operationally you're learning a lot starting right? from zero. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, I'm a white belt with the kids, sure. you know, I'm yeah. starting all over. And yeah. granted, I had a lot of team building, it's sports psychology, this, right. these types of like personal Sales strength. Tactics. Yeah. Like yeah. the personal strength and customer service aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the business, the car business works because you make little crumbs on all the little things. You sell a hat, you make five bucks. You sell a set of tires, make 30 bucks. Um, someone does a service, you know, and you make a 200 bucks or something like that. So the, you sell a car, you make a thousand bucks. Like, so there's all these little crumbs that add up. It's not, there's, there's not huge margins. So when you sell a car that's $50,000, you might only make eight or $900 mm -hmm. net on that entire car. Mm -hmm. That's it. And because it's very competitive with all the other stores that are all trying to sell the same car. So you have to like, it's a, it's about not letting the water drip off the table on the floor. You need to catch, you need to send the bucket there and catch it before it right, goes away. Right. So mistakes cost you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If the finance guy makes a mistake, the company charges you back, the bank charges you back the 1500 bucks that mistake, you know, boom. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't put the right paperwork in the car deal, you, the customer gets upset and you might have to, and then they might come after you in small claims court. You have to settle for $5,000. There's a lot of this type of stuff that happens. Um, and there's all these vendors that are after you all the time for weird stuff like, oh, we're going to generate leads. We're going to generate leads. If you don't have cars, you're not going to get any leads. You can't sell right. stuff if it's not there. So it doesn't even matter. Um, so you have to commit to this growth process. And it's tough because everybody's on commission. So mm -hmm. you have to look at people and say, listen, it's going to be lean for a couple months, but we're, but in six months, we'll have come out of that and mm -hmm. it'll be way better than it would have been because we have mm -hmm. to try this thing. And when you're a rookie and you're telling people that they're wrong about something, even if you're right, massive resistance. So you have I'm to build sure. trust all the time. So that and motivate, you know, continue to motivate mm -hmm. your team to like see the light at the end of the tunnel kind of, right? Yes. Long-term thinking. Yeah. It's all, and, and this is a consistency for me. It's all about having what I like to call low time preference, mm -hmm. being a good parent, being a good investor, being a business owner. It has mm -hmm. to be low time preference. What I do today impacts me 10 years from now, five years from now, whatever. It's not what I do today pays me today. If you think right. like that, you have a tendency to spiral out of control and not catch things. You have to think of it like you're driving a you're driving a train. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you're adding additional like cars to the train. And that's like slowing the train down, changing directions in the train, going around corners in the train. Like you have, to, there's like only so much mm -hmm. change you can impart into that before you flip it off the tracks. And the reason why a lot of people fail in the car business is because they try to do things too quickly. So I had some experience with that because I was a dealer owner before mm -hmm. I got here and I had watched the culture of our Mazda stores and stuff that I had in Chicago grow mm -hmm. and do better. Some did better than others. Mm -hmm. And I knew what was, what worked and what didn't work to a degree, not to the granular level. Cause you yeah. only learn that by, you know, d jumping in the mud Doing pit. It. Yeah. 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 So how'd you, did you meet people through like being on the floor and like, literally, right? Yep. Going to charity events, That's how you, going to events, dropping kids off at school. Right. You know, I think the best friends that I've met in town, I've met sort of randomly mm -hmm. on the showroom floor mm -hmm. through charity events or 
at the school drop off line, right. so to speak. Like and it's like, the kids, yeah. that's what it is. I mean, right. you know, um, like we would run into each other dropping our kids off at school yeah. a couple years ago, yeah. you know, and I run into run into all sorts of other people. And, you know, then it's like, hey, what do you, you know, like, let's grab lunch sometime. Yeah. So because there's no traffic in Fresno. You, you, you can like plan things at pretty so slim true. margins. Whereas right. like if you're in LA, like someone has to live within like that three mile radius 100%. or work. you can't just like meet for lunch. Like yeah. everybody can get to Westwoods or Pismos or Annex or, or all the uh, you know, an um, right yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you can get to all these places pretty quickly. You can get yeah. to heirloom quickly. So if you say, Hey, you want to meet there in 30 minutes, you can get there. Right. You can't do that in LA. No. And so that was, but living in LA and being used to the pace of that for so long, um, it, I was I, I think like I still have that mindset. I'm going to cram everything I can into a day because I have all this extra space that's not spent in that's traffic. That's not spent commuting. Yep. I know. I know. I had an hour and a half commute for one of my jobs. Got a lot done, but it was on the phone. Right. You know? Yeah. This was pre-podcast day, so I mm-hmm. wasn't even like learning anything. It was really more just making work, rolling calls at that point. Um, but yeah, there's a convenience factor about it too. I mean, your dealerships are literally four minutes away from here, if that. Yep. You're, you know, you live close. Your kids are close in school. All the things. Yep. So, so now, you know, you're here. You've been here since Valentina was a baby, right? Since I've or I've been living Ken- here since November 2016. 2016. Yep. Yeah. So this is home. It's like seven years now. Yeah. And, you know, there's always this this thing as mm-hmm. a business owner to say, oh, well, what's next? You right. know. And that's a little bit of a trap psychologically because it means you're not grateful for where you are, where you are. Mm-hmm. And if you say, where do I want to be in 20 years? That's a little mm-hmm. bit different, you know, because then you're saying, oh, I have this huge mountain to climb and I want to get there and then reward myself with something or whatever. Um, right. But because Fresno presents like a, a, it's like a very unique place to live in California. It's not like other California cities. Mm-hmm. And I've lived in other California cities. Um we love it here and we have this ability to have a high quality life. We have a cool house with space. You can't get, you know, the type of backyard that you can get in Fresno in Orange County, you know, it's true. for anywhere near the same amount of money. Right. And, um, you know, so you spend less on housing. You might spend more on travel because you got to connect through SFO or LAX if you mm-hmm. want to fly somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can just drive to a lot of these places. You can drive to Carmel, you can drive to LA, you can go up to Shaver, go to Bass Lake. Um, you know, you can go to slow or some of these other places. And so as long as you have places to go when it gets to be too hot or whatever, and even if it's only to grab a burger up at hungry hut and shaver, you know, even if it's only that it's something and Mm -hmm. you and the kids can do that. And so we, we do little things like that in the summertime, but my kids are pretty entrenched, you know, they're doing martial arts class. They're like orange belts and jujitsu, uh, it's radical. Love that. It's radical. Yeah. I was talking to Liz about that the other day, and it's inspired. It makes me want to get the girls in there. I'm like, yeah. give them the gift of not only confidence, strength, mental strength, physical strength, but self defense. I'm like, that is badass. Yeah, and yeah. athleticism, and I think and th- athleticism. Yeah. I played a lot of different sports as a kid mm-hmm. when I was like, you know, eight to ten years old. I, I played basketball. I played soccer. I played like flag football. I played all this different stuff. And it helped me understand how to move my body around to like run and, you know, kick a ball, throw Mm -hmm. a ball, catch a ball, all these other different things. And what they say is that when you're developing kids like athletically, you know, Mm -hmm. um, if you give them like a really well-rounded approach to all these other sports when they're like little kids, like toddlers and Mm -hmm. into young, like preteen, then by the time they focus in on something, they've kind of worked the whole Vitruvian man all the angles of their body Mm -hmm. they've run and they've cut on the grass and they've done this and they've slid and they've jumped and they've done all these things you know and it 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 gets them more prepared to focus on fine-tuning skill development right so if you think about golf as an example like how gnarly of a sport that is it's Mm -hmm. like just tiny little variations in the club face allow you to hit the ball differently um that's a completely different sport than, uh, you know, jujitsu, obviously. Right. But if you do jujitsu or gymnastics or something like that, then you 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 know how to use your hips. Mm-hmm. If you know how to use your hips, then you might be a better golfer mm-hmm. one day. Like skill building. But yeah. I feel like the girls are getting to the age where they can tell you, Dad, I don't want to do that. Or Mom. Yeah, and that's a phase know? too, right? So like, that's hard. So that happened. And yeah. uh, what happened was Katarina, our younger daughter, mm-hmm. saw an opportunity to be better at something than Valentina <laughs> and decided to keep going. Yeah. And then Valentina was like, whoa, she's making a lot of progress. I think I want to do this again. Yeah. 
because I I don't want to um I don't want my little sister to beat me up if I give her crap. I yeah. I want I need to be able to defend myself. So yeah. in a way, it's become an arms race That's with the good. two girls yeah. in a peaceful way. Yeah. But you know psychologically there's some aspect of wanting to keep the pole position as the older For daughter sure. to be better at everything than yeah. the younger daughter. Yeah. But Valentina is really more of an artist, and I, of course, encourage her to play something like um, tennis or something like that because I think that's kind of how she's built. Whereas yeah. I think Katarina has more options because how muscular she is. Mm-hmm. She's like so physically strong and so energetic, mm-hmm. and she wants to like run really fast and play sports like soccer and stuff. Yeah, and she wants to do like if she was a baseball player, she'd be more of a third baseman, mm-hmm. and V would be more of a pitcher if that makes sense. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how siblings can be so different? So I mean, different. Even you and your brother. Your brother's an artist, and you were yeah. in a totally different industry, mm-hmm. totally different interests, grew up in the same household. I'm just like kind of mind blown by that as a parent because mm-hmm. you think, oh, yeah, your kids are going to do the same activities. They're raised in the same house, eating the same food, doing all the same things. But mm-hmm. I'm like, they are wildly different. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many things that go into that. The birth right? order uh the age difference uh the astrological sign True. male female lefty righty uh mm-hmm. myers briggs enneagram type uh diet my brother ate like crap he was a, he had a horrible diet yeah um my brother is like 5'9 145 hmm. i'm 6'1 200 right yeah. we have completely different body types uh, yeah. my brother was a really good baseball player and then really? he quit because he didn't want to be cj's little brother yeah. he didn't want to be coached he didn't want to be doing the thing that I did. Yeah. You know what I mean? He yeah. wanted to do his own thing. Do his own thing. So he started rollerblading and skateboarding and doing that mm. type of stuff in the 90s when he turned to like 13. So yeah. that's when he quit. And I was very disappointed because my brother was an all-star, wow. like a Little League all-star. So so was I. Right. He might He didn't have the commitment level I did. But my brother's body type, if he would have developed it, he could have been a shortstop or a second baseman or something mm-hmm. like that. He wasn't. He, he just, he didn't want to lift weights. He didn't mm-hmm. want to work. He didn't want to be, have teammates. He didn't want to rely on anybody. He didn't want anybody to rely on him. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to just do his own thing as he saw fit. Mm-hmm. But physically, he could have been a baseball player professionally. Wow. And a couple of years, I mean, this is like way back. So a bunch of my friends uh, do adventurous stuff like cliff diving and motorcycling and stuff like that, like dirt bike enduro riding and stuff. So wow. um, they were like, hey, let's do like a pickup baseball game. And my brother and I played catch for like a week in preparation for this. And he could still <laughs> throw the ball like yeah. 80 miles an hour, wow. having not thrown since he was 13 years old wow. as like a 30 year old. So yeah. my brother, even though he's not like, tr- he's not like really muscular, he's really wiry. Mm-hmm. And so if he would have lifted weights, he would have been one of those people that's like just mega shredded. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he just wasn't motivated for that. Right. He didn't want to spend an hour in the gym. Right. Absolutely not. So and you have to be dedicated and motivated to r- take it to the next level. I right. Imagine, yeah. My brother wanted to be famous. So he would have been like a TikTok. Like if he was 20 years old now, he'd be like a TikTok mm-hmm. influencer type person. That's kind mm-hmm. of his more of his personality. Speed, yeah. Whereas I'm more of like an engineer and I want to build things. And like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like if you buy my thing because it's awesome, that's great. But I'm not going to sell it to you. Yeah. You know, my brother's like, hey, I've got stuff to sell. You know, it's like two different mindsets. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I. I'm an artist in my own way. I'm a photographer. I'm a painter. I, I draw. Yeah. Um, I've been doing that for a long time. You know, I've been it's like probably a, where Valentina gets it, don't you think? Yeah. And Liz is artistic in her own ways too, though. Yeah. Liz is like really uh, she, like interior design wise. Like that's like her, her like really mega niche. Whereas mm-hmm. I'm more of like a, like a floor plan architect, Yeah. you know? And Good so that's, combo, it's a though. great combo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when we did the house in LA, we did, we built a spec house together and oh, cool. um, we worked on that. Uh, and it was really a fun project. Yeah. Um, uh, it was. See, not many people could say it was a fun project building a house with their spouse. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like sometimes it can be stressful. And be like, I just want to get this done. So for you to say it was fun, that's cool. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things. Like I literally had it on my list, you know. And yeah. eventually, when I we built the house, we finished it, and mm-hmm. it ended up in Architectural Digest. So I'm like, that's amazing. That's a cool checklist Heck thing yeah. to get off to. I sold it to Zed. The, the music producer DJ guy. I was going to say. So he bought it. Wow. Um, he recently sold it. So I sold it to him, I think, in 2018. 
And then mm. um, he uh, he sold it, I think, last year or earlier this year. Wow. Um, and I had this whole master plan for how I want to develop it. But it was like, you know, this super gnarly house in Beverly Hills. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was really cool. And it was a Very big, cool. big financial project. But um, that was another path for me. Mm-hmm. If I didn't do the car dealership thing, I could have done that. I was, like architecture, mm-hmm. homes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's something like I, I drew the house. I angled it. I had all the the proportions and everything kind of done. And then the architect, I gave to the architect and I was like, this is what I want to do. This is how I want it oriented on the land. And he Mm -hmm. kind of architected it all out Mm -hmm. and like enlarged it. And I was like, yo, I have a budget. Stop. You know what I mean? (laughs) Um, But I had all these weird things about it. So if you, um, anyway, so it's kind of like, it's kind of a thing. I've I've had a chance to do all these things, you know, I participated in in a a team that wrote a book and, um, you know, built a house, ended up in architectural digest. All these things are cool. cool. So now I just need to do like, I think I still have to sell a script. I want to like write a movie. I was going to say, so CJ kind of in wrapping up. You've done a lot. We're like halfway through. I know. Right. Maybe. I feel yeah. like we need to do a part two. If mm. you're down. Um, what's next? I feel like you have a lot of moving parts. No pun intended. Yeah. And you know, where do you see your near future going? Well, I just have to. So my, this is the, this is how I live my life. This is my day, right? Yeah. I fall asleep at like nine o'clock. Yeah, let's, I wake I, up at 1230. You fall asleep at 9 p.m. Yes. You wake up at a little past midnight? Yes. Every night? Yes. So are you somebody that functions on no sleep? Correct. Clearly? Yes. Okay. So so I sleep like four or five hours a night. Every night. Sometimes three hours. Sometimes six hours. But usually like always less than the seven or eight thing. I was like, who, what? Who has time for that? That's a thing. Too much stuff to do. Some people can function on little sleep. I am not one of those. So (laughs) my ideal day, this is how it kind of goes, is I put... I put Max to bed. Usually, he, you know, I put him to bed around 8.30 or 9. And then mm-hmm. I sleep for a couple hours. And then um, I, I'm up and I just can't go to sleep. So then I do all my reading and my research and my emailing and all that stuff between 12 and 3, 12 and 4. Wow. And then I sleep again from like 4 to 5.30. It, if I have to do the bottle thing or the diaper thing or whatever. Yeah, then up, yeah, it's a, it's a niche thing that actually really helps us a lot because mm-hmm. then I'm totally alert and capable yeah. and so Liz the, last night she was like hey do you want to go give him a bottle I'm like I don't want to go give him a bottle but I'm already awake already I was up. like l- in bed you know like doom scrolling like going through Twitter <laughs> like looking at the, the markets x. and all this other stuff yeah x <laughs> and I'm like going through my emails and like writing responses and all this stuff and like pre-scheduling oh everything gosh. and writing my tasks down Ma- yeah. I make a lot of checklists yeah um yeah, then then I wake up and you know no, no, no. I go so one of the kids. So you're up at twelve thirty. Yeah. Until when? Three or, or four. And then what? You take a little snooze at three or four. Yeah, I do like a little, a little like cat a nap. like a cat nap Kay. or or yeah, and if I depending on what time I wake up from the cat nap, that's when I work out. So okay. I, wor- I work so out from like workout. four to five or Kay. four thirty to five thirty or four thirty to f- five, depending on how much time I have. Mm-hmm. Um. And that's, that gets me going. And then I get the kids up and ready to go and dressed and I take them to school and Liz builds their lunches Mm -hmm. and then, uh, the girls get themselves dressed. Yep. I get the, I get, uh, Dom or Max dressed. I get Dom changed. Liz takes Dom on a walk. I chug an espresso. I have a very specific method for my espresso. Typically, um, frozen spoon under the drip so the uh-huh. drip hits the frozen spoon okay it does something metallurgically mm. or temperature wise so it takes all the ashy bittery taste out mm. of the espresso which is usually like licking the bottom of a trash can <laughs> and then um i mix grass-fed butter or grass-fed so, cream yeah. uh malden sea salt and agave and then i kind of spin up sometimes a little cinnamon agave, it's like so it, it has a little sweetness yeah i don't do any sugar i just do agave so mm. agave mixes better because it's already liquid mm. This is like a really great life hack. And then you have like, it's the perfect temperature at that point. Cause usually it's like boiling yeah, hot. Yeah, you don't right, want that. Right, so right. anyways, rinse off the spoon, clean it, put it away. So wait, sorry. After the agave, any milk? No. Uh, either grass fed butter or like, he- or like whole milk, but grass fed. Oh. Yeah. My diet's pretty much like keto. I eat mostly meat, um, some vegetables. So I'm, I'm experimenting with farming. So, so that, that window mm-hmm. in between when I get up and when the kids get up, sometimes if I have 30 minutes, I'm out in the backyard, like pruning, like growing my potatoes and tomatoes growing. and peppers That's and stuff like probably that. Probably all self-taught, right? When in Rome, like, right? <laughs> We're in know. Fresno. You got to grow something. <laughs> you got to, yeah. yeah. Have some, uh, some 
uh, material to talk to all your farmer friends. Right. Too. And then I've, uh, the, and, and I'm doing, I have a composting project that I'm working on right now. So cool. And so I do that. And then I, I, I drop the kids off and then I go to work in like shorts and a t-shirt and mm-hmm. I walk around, assess things, write my tasks for the day at work. And then if I have like a email that I got to respond to or anything pressing, I do that. And then I go back home and then I either work out if I haven't worked out or I just, you know, hang out with Liz and Dominic for a little bit. Sweet. And then I, um, you know, get dressed and go to work. Yeah. I'm, I'm at work till six, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night sometimes because yeah. I'm there on the ground doing it. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, I go home and then uh, dinner with the kids or, you know, hopefully and then mm-hmm. boom, start all over again. Then bedtime routine. But that's it. It's that it's it's that couple hours. And um, there's a way you can get yourself better at that. But mm-hmm. it really comes down to eating a certain type of food helps you sleep better. Yeah, so when you fall asleep, you're for... all the way asleep. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Isn't there a name for like the carnivore diet? Carnivore diet, yeah. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah, so uh, for Can anybody that? that's interesting, yeah, so I, I've done this a couple of times where yeah. I went hardcore carnivore, but I'm, I'm like like low-key carnivore. Cave, it's called the, like, the caveman diet. Or yeah, there's different. like the lion diet where all you eat is like red meat and salt and water and that's it. So you have to eat like organs. You have to eat like heart and liver and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So I've learned how to cook all these things. So You've I, eaten those things. Oh, yeah, I do liver. I like liver a lot, actually. Wow. So like iron skillet, saute it in milk. Like a little bit of a little bit of uh, seasoning on there, like cook it over a somewhat low heat, and then mm-hmm. crisp it at the end, like kind of like a steak, and then you mm-hmm. slice it real thin, and then you can eat it. And it's so you palatable. enjoy cooking. I love cooking. That's awesome. Yeah. So amazing. I de- my ideal scenario is if I had like my own little brisket restaurant where I was just out like on Sundays <laughs> just doing briskets. Amazing. So I'd sell cars f- five or six <laughs> days a week, smoke brisket on Sundays. Can you marry the two? Can you smoke brisket at one of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We have a Traeger at at the dealership. We actually have a Traeger at the dealership. That's legit. It's a thing. Yeah. So, so what's next is just, you know, continuing like hiring people that can support my vision, Mm -hmm. uh, looking, looking for people that are high level. We've hired some new people recently to help expand. Um, we're building new dealerships. So we're Mm -hmm. moving the stores over to Clovis. We have, uh, about 10 acres. We're building a new Porsche store, a new BMW, new Audi. And then I'm in the process right now of like adding new brands. So we have some stuff to announce pretty soon. Not official yet. A couple more weeks. Um, And then I'll have more brands to sell. So the goal is to be like one place, one name, all the cars. All the cars so you want on the amazing. Lux level, if, if I'm the source for all those things, mm-hmm. then it makes shopping really easy because then we become our own portal at that point. Right. So you control more of the vertical. Um, and with a lot of the cars going electric, having electric charging uh, stations on campus That's amazing. and then a nice little coffee shop, maybe eventually a little little outlet for my brisket. It's you know, brisket on so the weekend. So show up, charge your car, eat some brisket tacos, uh, you know, Get it, get an espresso with a proprietary, like, you know, Vache and CJ kind of thing. Cause I've been, <laughs> I, I met him it. through this stuff too. And so, yeah, cool. um, yeah, that's he's, great. he's somebody that's inspiring for me locally in that regard as that's an entrepreneur. Really cool. So it's great. I mean, you can't be an entrepreneur in some of these cities. You can only do this in Fresno. You, right. You can only, you can dabble in Fresno because mm-hmm. the financial risk is lower. Um, if you want to, if you wanted to start a hair salon and you could do that in Fresno, you can't do that in San Francisco. I agree. You know? I do think there's something to be said about how we really do support each other in Fresno. Like yeah. we try to support local. There's a reason why there's a lot of local restaurateurs with their own unique concepts. Obviously there are franchises too and other like major brands, but I do feel like there's something to be said about the local support. And it sounds like over the years you've met a lot of really cool people and influential people in the community that have helped you support your vision here too. Yeah, it's all it's all hand in hand. And I mean, yeah. if you have somebody that is willing to take their time and explain their business to you and like talk about it in a transparent way, you ask mm-hmm. questions, they're very intrigued to like share that information, almost like a not like really a mentorship thing, but mm-hmm. just just to get to know people. And if you have a passion that aligns with someone else's business mm-hmm. and you meet the actual business owner, you know, and I, I like I asked, I'm, I've met a lot of these other restaurateurs and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I asked one of them one time, I'm like, so how do you do the tri-tip like this? And he's like, yeah. oh, this is how we do it. And I was like, interesting. Not that I'm going to compete and right. start, but I'm just like, yeah. I like knowing all this stuff. How it's made is very interesting because mm-hmm. who makes it? Where does it come mm-hmm. from? And in Fresno, that line is so short because it's like the farmers are here. The products are here. 100%. The the owner is back there. Mm-hmm. He's like in the kitchen. He's mm-hmm. you know behind the desk. He's in the office. He's upstairs. He's downstairs. Like 
it, the accessibility of the entrepreneurs here is is much higher than it is anywhere else mm -hmm. and we don't have what i like to call like the hustler culture here where people are like trying to put you together and make you buy stuff that you don't need it's True. more like it's more like the entrepreneurial culture and then like the the I'll call it like the matriarchy patriarchy thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's like you meet the queen bee or the, or the, or the king of the castle. Mm -hmm. And that guy's like, yeah, this is how we do it. You know what I mean? And right. he's like, Oh, you want to do stuff? Like this is how we do it. Like, how do you guys do it? Right. And everybody kind of feeds off that and, and it raises the level overall. Mm -hmm. So people that are willing to kind of get in the process can, can, you know, no, it's and true. we all want to like, Yeah. Better. There's some competition, but I feel like most of it is really community driven and, mm -hmm. One thing that I remember not loving about the L.A. scene was just that everybody wanted to be famous. Which is in like some way. It's worthless. Exhausting. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And one of many reasons I left. But I don't feel that here at all. You know, I feel I don't know from your perspective, not being here and moving here. I feel like, yes, people are trying to make a name for themselves, sure. but they're not necessarily trying to be famous or Fresno famous or whatever that looks like to them. Well, you know? this is a good thing. I figured this out when I was in Dallas. Right. When you're surrounded by flat topography, there's n the only thing that keeps you humble is somebody has a higher floor of their office or a taller building than you mm. that's the only thing in dallas that like you can go on right somebody mm -hmm. has a bigger house a flashier car collection or their dad owns this building or they own this building or something right. like that and my building's taller than your building so therefore i'm better than you yeah when you're in a place like fresno that you know on a good day you can see the mountains and you can see like you know sort of god's splendor mm -hmm. it humbles you mm -hmm. and mountain people as i like to think about it in that sense as a or or even beach people coastal people they're aware that the ocean could just be angry and wipe them out like they're <laughs> they're aware of that finality of and the powerlessness of being a person yeah. in a world created by like you know other forces yeah but when you're in a city that it's only human forces influencing stuff yeah. really like it's just flat and it's just buildings mm -hmm. People get this ego thing because there's nothing humbling them. Whereas like, yeah, yeah, go go try to go hiking. Go go hike Half Dome and let me know how big <laughs> your ego is after that. You, that true. will humble your ass very quickly, right? <laughs> so true. And so when you're in, in the beauty can humble you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think so when you see people that are from certain places, whether it's Wyoming, which I have a particularly, uh, you know, I have a very strong affinity for Wyoming, Colorado, whatever. You meet a lot of very humble people. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter how much money they have. You know, right. and people in Fresno are like that. Like they have to get their hands dirty at work and they have mm -hmm. to be physically present because otherwise mm -hmm. people won't respect their business. True. Oh, that guy's at the coast all the time. Mm -hmm. That guy's that guy's in Tahoe. He's never mm -hmm. here. You hear that as a derogatory thing that right. this person runs an absentee business. Mm -hmm. And so like that is the only thing that limits your success is if you're not physically present and people think you're big leaguing them because you're acting like you're L.A., mm -hmm. that's where you get nuked in Fresno. So don't you think in a way, having said that probably hard to see now but in a way the whole change of you like essentially being forced to be the gm of the dealerships that you just bought might have been the best thing for you to be more present than maybe you would have been otherwise right a hundred no offense maybe you would have been that guy that was like yeah going all the places doing all the things who yeah. knows right yeah it's what the, if? the catalyst but in a way you know it's like Right. It's yeah, for sure. Because people can come see me and if they have a problem with me, they're going to mm -hmm. leave a voicemail. They're going to mm -hmm. come knock on my door mm -hmm. and I have to deal with that heat and that friction. Right. But the fact that I'm there, even if I can't fix the problem the way mm -hmm. they want it fixed or whatever, uh, even if they're scammers and they're trying to scam me on something, mm -hmm. at least like they're taking a crack at me face to face, toe to toe. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a I don't know, there's a value in that that's a little bit different um than you would get yeah if i was at the beach and people thought that i was better than them and i was acting like that if i'm showing up to work every day i'm not better than anybody right you know what i mean You're my employees know i'm not work. better than them yeah. the customers know i'm on their yeah. level and that's what i just want i want i want to be on everybody's level in that regard mm -hmm. and you know at some point we'll get big enough that i'll have to scale and i won't be able to be like the active general manager of two brands at the same time but i've hired a guy that's going to eventually take audi over mm -hmm. and then as we get these other brands then i'll sort of you know spend some more time at those places to kind of get them going right. but it will be required to have like mike at my bmw store he's mm -hmm. essential for me you know that's amazing. and i you know him and i are kind of the two head people at the campus now mm -hmm. but eventually i'll need a third person a fourth person whatever and yeah. and and we we'll, we will need that and and that will once i do that i'll still be on the campus mm -hmm. you know kind of like roaming around mm -hmm. um I won't be as vital to the day-to-day -day operations for like 
I, mean, I literally build all the cars on the configurator for Porsche. So like every Porsche that comes in, I literally name them. I have like little names and like we had one that was beige on beige and I was like, Oh, this is for sure. Like a Gladys loves bingo. <laughs> this is like a 70 year old white lady Here that's going to come in wearing beige pants. And she's like kind <laughs> of fall in love with this car. And literally that's what it was. That was like, that you just crazy. dream it up and it is yeah. that. And How so fun creative for you though. Yeah. It's that. So that's my little, that's my little, you know, twist right now, but yeah. eventually I won't be able to do that anymore because well, I'll just to your point, building a strong team. The team is the key. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at it from a different lens, kind of in wrapping up, because I feel like we could be here. For I'm sorry. All yeah. day. Don't be sorry. This yeah. is so great. So many ways we could go with this. So as an entrepreneur and somebody who has essentially changed industries altogether, mm -hmm. like very basically you went from being essentially a professional athlete to an entrepreneur, specifically in the luxury car space, right? For somebody who's considering a career change, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for them? Okay. Before I changed careers officially, mm -hmm. I did study my industry a little bit. Okay. It's essential to do that. Okay. Uh, what I did wrong was I never went to go work for anybody else. And what that, and the in only, that industry, in the industry, I never worked for anybody else. Mm -hmm. I just did it. And as a result of that, I had immediate pressure to succeed mm -hmm. and I had no absorption because it was fire hose mm -hmm. and it was sink or swim. And I honestly think that I would have sunk if I didn't have the, the sleeplessness, insomnia thing, if I wasn't able to pull those types of, cause I crammed to learn. I crammed to catch up, catch sure. up to speed before yeah. everything sank. And, and when you just start a business as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, you have no margin for error. There's a reason why 80% of businesses fail. It's because people don't either have the resources. Up to 80%. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. I knew it was over sure. half. No, I've wow. had businesses absolutely fail. Like I had a drone company like hmm. 14 years ago, you know, I was going to, I was designing drones for like the border patrol and like DARPA and stuff like that. Interesting. Um, I had like a aquatic submarine drone that was for reconnaissance for like spying and like foreign countries and stuff. And I didn't get the contracts. Mm -hmm. So I, I threw all this money down a hole, like developing this stuff with a, with a Naval scientist and like literally like our lab, like burned and blew up and we lost everything. Oh, and like, that was it like a couple hundred grand down the drain. Wow. So, um, that was an L they're not all <laughs> W's, you know what I mean? But um, learn, when, when the, when you have a chance to leverage your skill set and your winning percentage goes, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what your winning percentage is. You need to plow all of your, all of your assets into the, the thing that has the chance to pay off the biggest mm -hmm. when you have the momentum to pay off big. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to bide your time and wait and enter at the right point. You can't just rush into it. So I would say, you know, study, the industry as a paid intern by going to work for somebody else suck up your pride and go work for somebody that's successful if i mm -hmm. wanted to start a restaurant i would go work for vache mm -hmm. go work for fansler mm -hmm. i go work for um you know i go work for casey Choi. i go work for, for one of these guys that has a good restaurant that i like i'd go work at annex i'd go get a job yeah like working as a freaking dishwasher yeah. and I would work my way up the system to a mm -hmm. point where even though I'm a, you know, high paid athlete guy, whatever you have, if you can't wash the dishes, you will not, we, you will not be able to function as a restaurateur and then you have to do that. So mm -hmm. if you did that, you could probably learn in six to nine months what it'll take you three or four years and potentially failing along mm -hmm. the way as a, as the owner of the business. Cause then you really learn from the inside. You see what it lo looks like. If I would have gone and worked for like a Penske car dealership or a Lithia car dealership or like a big private store or something like mm -hmm. that, I would have been much better off than owning my own dealerships. Mm -hmm. I could have just, I could have never owned anything, mm -hmm. gone to work for a dealer as a sales guy mm -hmm. and then worked my way up a little bit as a sales manager and then taken the money mm -hmm. that I had saved up and mm -hmm. then bought the right dealership at the right time. Instead, I just bought a bunch of stuff and like some of the stores sucked and lost a lot of money. Some of them won. Mm -hmm. um, that was the worst thing I did mm -hmm. was I just started plowing money into stuff thinking, Oh, these guys are all incentivized. They'll, it'll, it'll work out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. So work for somebody else first, uh, get paid to do it, you know, get paid to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, Figure out what your real, real skills are. Like, what are you really good at? Not are, perceived. Yeah, not perceived. <laughs> like actual. Yeah, like what are your actual skills? Yeah. Like how organized are you? Mm -hmm. How 
how competitive are you? How sympathetic are you? How good of a listener are you? Mm -hmm. And figure out what industry that actually plays well in and mm -hmm. ask your friends to evaluate you honestly and say like, what would you do if you were me? Like where, what would I get into? You might already have an idea of what you want to get into, mm -hmm. but if it requires investment and money, then you're probably better off waiting and working for somebody else to create a little bit of a safety net before you strike out on your own to start a business that you don't know anything about. Right. And, uh, you know, partnerships are horrible most of the time and amazing the rest of the time. So that might be a 20 to 80 ratio. It mm -hmm. might be 90, 10 in terms of terrible, uh, just mm -hmm. depends on the industry you're in, you yeah. know? Um, and those are the two things. So be very careful about your partners and, and, and go, go work for the best of the best and mm -hmm. see how the best of the best operate. Because like, why would you ever want to, do anything else like right. having a bad example and saying i don't want to be like this that still leaves so many possibilities open you might not learn fast enough and it's your business true. might fail well and i feel like there's a common theme of a lot of what you've been saying which is be patient mm -hmm. like you know i feel like we're in this world of like fast consumption needing immediate results i want to learn how to make an apple pie well i can do it in five seconds by looking at this tiktok video type of mentality and I feel like you're kind of, you but know, making money, making apple pies is a whole different thing. Fair. <laughs> right. Fair. Right. Because of experimenting at home or whatnot. But I, I think it's kind of hard for some people to see big picture long term sometimes. So I'm getting, gathering that a lot from your life lessons mm -hmm. and your experience of like, be patient, wait, look at big picture. Don't look at the now necessarily all the time, you know? The big picture helps you navigate mm -hmm. because it's like a North Star. Mm -hmm. It keeps you on track as things are challenging and things are difficult and you stop swerving every time and you stop mm -hmm. smelling the roses when you're halfway there. Mm -hmm. You you develop this heading, this emotional, psychological, you know, spiritual heading. I'm mm -hmm. gonna get there. That's where I'm gonna get. And then you, you just keep going that direction and eventually you do get there. Like, yeah. you know, if you have to, if we have to drive to Florida from here, we know we have to head east. If we just keep getting, e going <laughs> east, take, yeah, eventually we'll see trip. a sign. But if we go like, oh, maybe we go south first and then we go north and then we do a little east and then we do, no, 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 no. You have to go east. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And and really a lot of your destinations are thousands of miles away mm -hmm. on a personal goal or personal development basis. Whether you want to be a bodybuilder or you want to be a home builder or a, a, an elite level uh, agricultural consultant or a restaurateur or mm -hmm. a PR firm or whatever, mm -hmm. you have to say that this is where I want us to get to. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to help us funnel because you only have so many resources so you want to funnel those resources into forward progress mm -hmm. and that's how you do it that's right. the secret so like i sold out to baseball and i was like if i get far enough with baseball i'll get cool cars <laughs> I, i'm not gonna be a car salesman when i need to be a baseball player mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i'll sell cars later i'll figure it out uh but is if you want to be a doctor you have to go through all that school right all that there and True. then once you get there Okay, cool. Now you can start mm -hmm. your own practice. Mm -hmm. But until you're board certified, you can't do it. So you have to get through all that stuff first. And if you start counting your chickens before they, they hatch, it's death. It doesn't it's work. It's absolute death. Yeah. You have to operate on building the farm mm -hmm. and like just focusing on all the, f the building, 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 building. Because if you start harvesting too early, you're robbing yourself. Yeah. That's, that's something that is like very prevalent today. And I think people... They're like, I started a business. I want to get a Ferrari. And it's like, whoa, dude, hang on. Hold the phone. Like, yeah. is your business going to survive a wobble? Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, whoa, back up. You know what I mean? So you talk to them about that. Like, I talk to everybody about you that. Get I mean, at some point, you got to get a little personal, right? It's like, what is this? What's the deal? But think about this. Someone comes and buys a car for me. I yeah. know what their credit report is. Fair. Like, if you come in and you're yeah. like, hey, I want to get a loan on this 911 or something like yeah. that. Like, your your FICO is going to come through. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, good job. I'm going to be like, <laughs> right, we should talk about this. We need this. to work on this. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, you do see that. Like, I, yeah. I know what people make. I, you know, and in a way there's, I mean, it's a personal thing like already. I, right. I forget it all, you know, but in right. the moment I'm like, okay, this is the, I'm assessing the situation. Right. Can we even get you qualified for this? Or yeah. do you even need a, why do you even need a loan? True. Like, what are you doing getting what a loan? What are you doing? Yeah. Like, bro, come on. Yeah. So, um, or leasing versus buying. Sure, right? sure. Yeah, and and that. a lot of this stuff you learn along the way, but you know, if you're willing to be transparent, mm -hmm. you can get farther. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're willing to be communicative and ask the right questions and you can't feel dumb for asking questions mm -hmm. like this is tough like life is hard mm -hmm. life business is brutal mm -hmm. there's someone trying to rip you off every minute yep steal your clients 
steal your business, mm-hmm. do all this stuff. And it's, mm-hmm. it's horrible. So yeah. it's, so for me, I just look at it like, hey, this is just more competition. And instead of a sword and a shield and like, you know, like people <laughs> chanting like, like chariots and stuff in the Roman days. Yeah. It's just like, okay, well, if I build better cards, I'll get more people to show up. Yeah. And I'll sell them more stuff. And build and the relationship building. Too. And if I'm nicer, that dealership loses and I win. Hundred percent. Yeah. Very cool. CJ, you're awesome. Thanks for sharing. I feel like we have we could still be talking for more. So for people that don't know you that want to continue learning more about what you're doing in our community, in business, as a dad, as a, you know, inspirational entrepreneur, what how can they follow along? Like Yeah, I mean like, I I, I, know, I on your social media, do you feel comfortable with putting that out yeah, there? Yeah, for sure. My my Instagram's CJ Wilson photo. Okay. Um there are imposters. I have no uh I have no underscores or weird symbols or anything okay. like that, so don't be f- fooled. Um, I, you know, people can DM, I get DMS all the time. Yeah. People follow me on LinkedIn. I get messages LinkedIn, from people. Cool. Um, you know, I, if I know somebody and we have connections on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. then I'll generally approve you. Uh, mm-hmm. but I try not to get spammed by vendors. So I'm like very wary of like Fair. certain types of yeah. businesses adding me. But if they send me a personal message and like, Hey, I liked you on this podcast. I'll be like, okay, cool. That's great. great. Yeah. Um, I am on X or Twitter as mm-hmm. straight edge racer, which is S T R eight E D G E racer. Uh, because I'm straight edge, I've had a lifelong commitment to not doing drugs or drinking, so that's kind of a tough so thing yeah, to uphold. If you but don't mind me asking, what is that? What is straight edge? What does that entail? Uh, you said no drinking, yeah, no drugs, never, that's amazing. not once, never had a beer that's or anything amazing. like that. Um, Good for you. I didn't feel like I had any margin for error as an athlete, and I I didn't True. feel like I was going to make it anyways. So I had to take I had to like always make forward progress and mm-hmm. I didn't want to stop and smell the roses and have fun mm-hmm. I had some family members on both sides of the family that had problems with drugs and alcohol mm-hmm. and I was like well they're not gonna they don't turn out well that's very mature of you like from a young age right? well we had like a kid overdose and when I was 12 Oof, on speed yeah. at like seventh grade wow. and I was like well that dude's like that's, gonna die that's he's not traumatizing gonna, he's yeah. not gonna make it to the majors yeah and I just knew that uh I you know I wasn't like bigger and better than everybody else yeah. i was like little and like figuring it out you know so you i had to like really take yeah. progress yeah um so i just think you know it's it's difficult to raise kids today with all the temptation that's out there mm-hmm. i w- our kids are still pretty young so god knows what's going to happen in like five more years when they're like getting into middle school and high school yeah. um but you know I think like people make their own choices. I am not a person of moderation. As you can tell, I'm pretty extreme. (laughs) I kind of go for it. And I think like if I did drink, I'd probably try to be really good at it, which would be a problem. Um, No, but it's true. It's It's listen, but it's, it's it's like, look in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Like I used to, yeah, Yeah. I used to sit down and play video games for like 16 hours straight. Yeah. I have an addictive personality. You have an addictive personality, yeah. I know that. Extreme, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to turn out like these people on the street. So like, I can be addicted to learning. You're right. And that's way Which more productive. Like the best. Yeah. And it's like weird. Uh, yeah. But I, I really enjoy learning. I, I enjoy cool. pushing myself. And, um, you and know. And I see you guys have done that with your kids, with your girls. You know, like they're very, I feel like, obviously very smart, very mature for their ages. And, stu- and academic. Yeah. Liz is very, Liz has got him in Kumon and got him in all the stuff very, and is supplementing yeah. it. I went to Montessori as a kid. So I Did was, yeah, I was like motivated to be a self starter and learn. But like I said, I, I was an introvert, so the world of books is like a whole imaginary thing for me. And I think there's so much to be learned by the people that have already succeeded and people now, not guru classes. Mm-hmm. I'm s- specifically ruling out guru classes. Okay. What do you mean guru classes? These like scammers like Manny Koshman and stuff that are like, oh, co- like I'll teach you the secrets of business. It's like you take other people's money yeah. and you cut it into smaller pieces and then you give a big slice to yourself uh-huh. and you Instagram it and then people think oh, you're richer than you are. I literally just watched a documentary about this, Age of Influence. Have you seen that? No, I haven't seen it. Oof. But there's a lot of scammers out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the real successful people... They write books and the books are either free or very cheap mm-hmm. or they give advice away for free. Right. Scammers charge you for advice that you can get for free from experts. True. This is like a very important thing True. to understand. And if you, you can take like Harvard and MIT classes online mm-hmm. and they're not that expensive, you don't need to go take some like influencer marketing BS mm-hmm. from one of these like workshops, SoCal yeah. guys that's like charging $10,000 mm-hmm. to have like an inner circle meetup. Like I hate that culture. Mm-hmm. I really despise that because they're not being productive people. They're just scamming for people. They're just wanting money. Yeah. And I'll say this. If like there's one particular guy 
Grant Cardone. He's a hundred percent a scammer, and he's gonna his whole thing is gonna blow up at some point, no. and it's bad. Yeah, and it's like I, I don't You're know fortune telling here. I, yeah, so I just I I see this coming from a mile away because I've seen it happen before, and I know where these people started because mm-hmm. you can research it and see. So if you do your own research on who you're reading, there's very few of these guys are as successful as you think they are mm-hmm. for doing the thing that they're telling you to do. Well, isn't there that term of like? The ones that are super flashy and out there are the ones that have the least amount of money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Robert Kiyosaki is a real investor. Like he's actually successful and he does real estate investing. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's a little bit cringy on some of his takes on things. But like the guy did it and he does and he did what he Mm -hmm. said he was going to do. And then he wrote a book and was more successful than he thought he was going to be and as a as an author so he kept writing books mm-hmm. but there's like an earnestness in that and he mm-hmm. said these are the lessons i learned from my rich father these are the lessons i learned from my real father you know like my my, my buddy's dad was rich and did all these things right and my dad was fearful and did all these things wrong mm-hmm. and so i like wanted to be like this guy so i did that and he Conscious like his decision. book is like cheap it's like six dollars you can get a copy of his book for six bucks or whatever what's you could, the name of this book rich dad poor dad rich dad poor yeah, and that's like a like a super influential book. Huh. Um, Warren Buffett is crusty, and he's ninety years old, and he says there are a lot of really like terrible things about Bitcoin. But he's very prominent about long term investing. He's yeah. he he has a lot of lessons to learn in that regard. But the people that are saying, "Hey, do this today, you'll be rich mm-hmm. tomorrow," mm-hmm. that is always a scam. It's impossible to do that. You cannot Clearly. sustain an infinite growth curve. And you see that with companies like Apple and Microsoft where they have these huge fluctuations Mm -hmm. where they're run by a wizard. The wizard leaves, they crash, and the wizard has to come back and fix it. And then like the new guy comes in after that guy dies, like Steve Jobs. Right. And like now it's like, eh, it's like they're doing all these other random things. It's like, is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. But I trust Apple with my money more than I trust Wells Fargo with my money. Mm-hmm. I'd rather own Apple stock than money in the bank with Wells Fargo yeah. because it's like, at least I know that they're incentivized. Whereas like some of these banks, they just rip you off. So I think there's, there's a lot of lessons that be learned out there and you could mm-hmm. be successful just doing one or two of these things. You don't have to do all 10. Yeah. And if you learn everything there is to know about certain industries or whatever, then you can be really good and operate in a niche and like go really far with. How do with you feel the about the term Jack of all trades? Uh, I think I think if you're dedicated, you can learn anything, uh-huh. but I don't think you can do everything. I, I think you can learn. That's an important distinction. I can learn anything, but I can't do it all, especially not at the same time. And I can have everything I want, just not all at the same time because you do have to make sacrifices. True. So if I want to really be a race car driver and a wealthy business person and a good dad, which one of those is the most important? At right. the end of the day, being a good dad and being a business person are more important than racing. And racing, I can do later. So I right, can good point. Wait. So maybe with the mindset of maybe not now. Yeah. You know, you have later. to get to the next level. There's always a plateau. And yeah. once you get to that plateau, you have the team, you're good. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like that's relatable as a working parent, too, because I think a lot of the times we're trying to, like, juggle it all. Right. Like, how am I going to drop off and make the meeting and somehow get dinner on the table at a decent time? But, right. you know, there's different seasons of parenting. There's different seasons of our careers and our lives that kind of, yeah, to your point, you can't do it all maybe at the same time, but you can do it all on Sunday. And then you, (laughs) then, then maybe on Monday you take some of that responsibility off your plate. Yeah. And there's no 50 50 with parenting either. It's Mm -hmm. not, or, or or marriage. Like you do have Mm -hmm. to split some days you're going to put in 90%. Some days you're going to take 90%. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what's, that's realistic. And people, I think, you know, my wife and I got in a really big fight about this when we first married and, my idea of going to the grocery store was give me half the list. I'm going to supermarket sweep, just sprint through. Supermarket sweep. <laughs> we'll get two carts. Yeah. You take your half. Wow. So you're I'll take tag my half. Teaming it. Okay. That, that was That's my idea. Impressive. We have, I, like, we can get it all done in 30 minutes if we do that. Then we can have 30 minutes to ourselves to funny. quality you're time. You're like trying to make the most time or efficient with your time. She's like, no, let's hold hands. Let's walk through. Let's take our time. <laughs> let's take an hour in the <laughs> store and go through together. And I was yeah. like, That's, so huge blow up on that yeah. when oh we first God. started dating uh, because I view everything in terms of that efficiency percentage. Mm-hmm. Like we have this much to get done. If we do it in this much time, we have time to do a completely different thing. And that's how you get everything done in my mind. And so she's started to kind of leverage that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a set amount of like I buy a whole I buy a half cow now. Mm -hmm. I order a half cow for for beef consumption and I have that. I order that. It's whatever. And then I have beef and I don't have to shop for beef for six months. That's nice. So it's I make one call. 
Mm -hmm. I pay, gets delivered. I separate it out in the freezer and then that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that that might save me 10 hours over the course of six months, maybe 20 hours. So now I have 20 hours. Can I learn a piano song? (laughs) Can I read more books to the kids? Can I do more push ups? Mm-hmm. Is there something I can make a value in that in that niche time? Mm-hmm. And and you know, can I can I do something selfish in that pursuit or learning or whatever? Right. That is totally the secret. But you have to have resources to do that and you have to have mm-hmm. perspective. Mm-hmm. The, so, but what happens is if you develop the perspective first, when you do get the resources, then you're hyper efficient with how you deploy them. It's and true. I, I didn't have a lot of money when I was younger, so when I got money, I already had plans. Mm-hmm. So I was able to like boop 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 and I had time to work out the plans like probably 10 years between making the plans and implementing the plans so I was able to refine it by watching other people succeed and fail along the same lines in the same categories Mm -hmm. and there's so many people out there doing what you want to do already um, are you going to learn from them or are you going to learn from your own mistakes? And it's way I cheaper. I think with that though, and I was just having a conversation with a friend about it, it's like, sure. Yeah. There's plenty of other people probably doing the same thing, similar things, mm-hmm. but it's not you. Right. And you're going to put your own spin on it. You're going to have your own relationships with people. You're going to bring your value to whatever situation that may be, whatever industry. So I feel like people that are super like, you know, petty and competitive and whatnot, it's like, there's enough business to go around here. There's a lot of mouths to feed. Yeah. And there's a lot of there's a lot of butts to put in seats, as we say in the car business. Yeah. Um, but, you know, w- it is competition, though. You do Fair. have to be better because people are going to spend their money with you or somebody else. Yeah, you do have to be better. That's but the what hard makes part. you better? Yeah, that's you and that gets back to and the look in the mirror, be to, honest. Yeah. Yeah, because you can learn stuff. Yeah. If you're not good at something and you know that's like holding you back, you figure it out. Or mm-hmm. hire into that strength. You might not be able to turn this person that's working for you doing this role into like this better version of themselves or this Mm -hmm. all-star version that does all the things, but you might be able to hire somebody that the two of them together become like a mini team within the team. Mm -hmm. And then you can count on both of them to get the whole thing done, you know, and Mm -hmm. then they are both succeeding. You've put them in a position to succeed and they're playing off each other in a positive way instead of competing each other. Like whoever doesn't do this gets fired. Okay. That sucks. So, right. you know, and if you, let's say salary wise, you have to pay each of those people 75 grand. Um, it might cost $200,000 to get the one person that can do everything. Mm-hmm. So you might be better off with the two people for 75 or maybe even two people for 85 mm-hmm. or 90 mm-hmm. because then they can field more questions communicate more because there's two of them to go around there's Mm -hmm. more overlap Mm -hmm. you having one person for 24 hours a day you get they get burned out right if you and then they're also a single point of failure person if they leave you're effed exactly and so there's the and i feel like two heads are always better than one sometimes sometimes (laughs) you You disagree well it if you you have to break the roles down one person steers thanks one, you know, one set of wheels turns uh-huh. the car. The other set of the wheels drives the car. Mm-hmm. Then you have a nav system. You have brakes. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you, you need people slowing you down financially to make sure that you're thinking where you want to go. Mm-hmm. You have to have people telling you well, what other people have done, mm-hmm. where the route is. You have to have the vision to look out the windshield and see around you to make sure no one's going to ram into you. Right. Mm-hmm. And you have to have the engine driving you, the passion, look the determination. All your little puns that it's, you got it's so, yeah, all these metaphors. <laughs> So metaphors. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like the, I, tr- I try to make every topic relatable and mm-hmm. I, that comes from like sitting there and pondering it over and over and over again yeah. to get to that. You want to get to the crystal, uh, the, the seed, the, mm-hmm. the, the deepest kernel of truth. And then if you get to that point, then you can kind of like, you can evaluate it in a cleaner way and then you mm-hmm. can relay it to people a little bit better. So mm-hmm. I think that's, that's, that's my special skill is that I can talk about a complex subject and get down to the deepest, smallest part of it. And then I can say, okay, what do you understand? What, yeah. what level are you at? And then doesn't matter what it is. I can try to figure out a way to get you to see it from that perspective that fr- through the lens that you already have. Totally. So, you know, I can give it to you through the mom lens and say, okay, mm-hmm. well, as a mom, you want this, this and that. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, I understand Like that. more relatable for people. And not to add another hat to your collection, but I mean, I could totally see you teaching in some capacity. Yeah. Uh, Have you ever thought about that? Well, I've done mentorship. Or you've done like yeah. bit, probably Bitcoin education items. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think I think it's I like the mentorship thing. F- structured teaching, like at a university or something mm-hmm. like that, is not my bag because 
uh, there'd be somebody that would say something in the admin side of things that would tell me that would be like so, CJ, that, you're crossing the line. Or yeah, something. and I yeah. would be like, listen, I'm I'm gonna be 100 percent honest with no agenda about this, and I'm gonna tell people the truth. Like I'm not gonna tell them what you want them to hear. Yeah. I'm gonna tell them the truth, and if yeah. you know, and and part of that ability, I don't know, willingness to call out scammers and like willingness to stand your ground, uh, that comes from like having a childhood with adversity yeah and um you know being bullied as a kid and stuff like that mm-hmm. it allowed me to like when i s- recognize that again and i see something going wrong i'm willing to call it out mm-hmm. and i don't care what happens to me right uh, at the end of the day so i think eventually you know it leads to me doing some sort of public service whether that's education yeah. or some sort of municipal thing i'm not mm-hmm. sure yet mm-hmm. um I, I do know that uh i think I believe that successful people owe it to society to give back. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a financial thing. I think it's a wisdom thing. So if you've learned a lot of tough lessons, then you can, you can benefit society from getting other people to understand those lessons earlier in life. Mm -hmm. And then you can create like a sort of a curve, an adoption curve of, um, performance or intellect or safety or whatever it is because if you know something's unsafe it's like hey guys rattlesnakes super dangerous yeah like my buddy died he got bit by a rattlesnake (laughs) like don't go near him you know like that helps society evolve and in the same sense there's all these other developmental things whether it's parenting or business wise or whatever that we literally would be better off than the people that are running things Mm -hmm. and because we've like we know certain things don't work you know, right. like you just know it doesn't work. And so when they keep trying these things, you're like, this is a scam. And you, mm-hmm. if you don't call that scam out, then we're basically all going to end up speaking. You know, we're all going to end up eating the bugs. And I'm, I'm <laughs> unwilling to do that. So we, we can do better. You we know? can do better. But that's where it's headed if we don't if we don't step up. If people yeah. people like me and people that are even better at, than me at all these other things that I do already – if those people don't step up and they just, they just kind of big league it and they're like, mm. ah, I'm above it. It doesn't matter if you don't look out for the little people. And, and like, if, if I don't want anybody to eat the bugs, right. But not just me. Well, the betterment of everyone. Right. Yeah. 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 Like we should be designing like spaceships that go to, you know, that go to interstellar space. We shouldn't be focusing on like, uh, we, we shouldn't be worried about where the power comes from. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that's like, that's some the problem, people do so. though to your point yeah but they it aside. it's all math yeah it's all math yeah we need power to have quality life you don't have air conditioning if you don't have power you don't need electric cars without power like what are you doing you get a bicycle <laughs> you know what i mean so um yeah. you know we're gonna revert back to sailboats and bicycles uh for transportation and horses if we can't figure out the power grid mm-hmm. because that's as the population grows you know um and we have all these extra taxpayers being born. You know, you you created three new taxpayers. <laughs> I, I created say, four. We, yeah. So, um, yeah, we uh, we need to do better as a society, and that comes from intelligence. It comes from logic. It comes from talking it out and hashing it out and working across the table or across the aisle. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, that's why I'm here to announce my presidency. Run. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, oh I, man, CJ, that's, that would be that's the future. Epic. You know, yeah. that's, because it's like it can't. I mean, people say it can't get worse. Then Gavin Newsom running things, I'm like, it can. It can. If he keeps running things, yeah. it will keep getting worse because yeah. it's been getting worse. Yeah. So we need to do something to have a better candidate than him and have, and that starts on a local level. We have Seems to be willing like to stand up. Seems like you're very passionate about that and compelled to do your part. So that's exciting. One day, one day, yeah. And uh, you you meet some of these people and you realize they're just regular people too. And right. there's people that start that they go in that direction because they want to make society better, and other people right. start that because they're like, oh, I heard Nancy Pelosi's rich. Maybe I could get rich doing this. And it's like. Well, maybe get rich first and learn some business lessons and get slapped around by life a little bit yeah. and then like then prevent people from making mistakes. Yeah. And that's a better way to do it. I think Fair. that's that's my, more my angle. But Fair. I'll wrap it up because you try, you've been trying to. So we can <laughs> no, stop there. But I appreciate the time. Right? Thank you're you, you're great at this. Thanks. You're a natural. It's been fun. Yeah. yeah. No. Like we were kind of talking about before. I'm trying not to overthink it and have fun. So I appreciate you taking the time to do it. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Feel free to rate and review this episode here and connect with us on Instagram if you have any thoughts, questions, or any guest suggestions. Thanks.